This is episode 36 of the Indie Film Academy podcast. Today we're talking with Rob Edwards, co-screenwriter of The Princess Frog, Treasure Planet, and former writer for In Living Color, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Full House, and much, much more. So, here we go. Them frog legs already. But they taste real good with the sauce pecan, right, Pop? You keep quiet. Oh. No, 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 no. Oh, my thoughts exactly. Two fingers. <laughs> it's time to catch us some frogs. <laughs> Welcome to the Indie Film Academy Podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Buff. Welcome to the Indie Film Academy Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Buff. Thanks for joining us here today. Screenwriters, you are in for a treat because we're talking with Rob Edwards. Rob has written for Pixar and Disney, a bunch of other places. He's the co-screenwriter of The Princess Frog, Treasure Planet. He used to work for In Living Color, um, Full House, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And not only is he an amazing screenwriter and teacher, but he's also funny as hell. So I really enjoyed this episode. Um, so I'll get to that in just a second. I also want to remind you that right now the IFA Masterclass in Film Sales is going on. You can go to IFA Masters and for two days, the set November 17th and 18th, you can have a free coupon to view all of the presentations for free. That's 15 hours of interviews, presentations about film marketing, film sales, everything that you need to know at the beginning of the filmmaking process so that at the end you're able to sell your film and then make another one and another one. So, you know, the key is really to be able to get the move, the, the funds you need to make the movies you want to make and slowly get bigger and bigger and bigger until you're making a living as a filmmaker. Once again, just I ifamasters.com and you will be set up. All right, here's my interview with Rob Edwards. Enjoy. Time to cover everything. Um, yeah. Would you mind just kind of going through, you know, and and so people have just uh, an idea of your background and where you're coming from. Can you give a little bit of a background in your career as a screenwriter? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I um, I'm originally from Detroit. Uh, I uh, went, uh, let's see, um, from there went to Syracuse, uh, uh, had a great time there. Uh, among my classmates was Aaron Sorkin and um, uh, Aaron Sorkin on the theater side and then Jay McInerney actually on the literary side. So uh, <laughs> oh. Jay was the was the grad student du jour and I was the undergrad du jour. So uh, uh, very fun. And studying with uh, Tobias Wolf, who is an amazing professor and now is at uh, uh, Stanford. Um and uh, let's see, from there, <laughs> my dad was a doctor and he said I had, uh, it basically said you got nine months to make a career, you know, to actually support yourself in, uh, in Hollywood or else you're, <laughs> you're coming back home, you're going to go to med school, you know, uh, and he's a, a gastroenterologist, so it was going to be guts, you know, for, for my entire <laughs> life. And yeah, so faced with that prospect, I, I, I said, okay, well, let me, let me see what I can do here. Um, I, uh, in college, actually started writing letters, uh, kind of fan letters to writers, just any writer, that, anything that I would see that I thought was well-written, I'd, I'd mm -hmm. pen off a letter. And I got a lot of responses uh, from a couple of people, and, and uh, uh, I basically asked them, if you were a teenager in college right now, what would you recommend that you do? <laughs> you know, what would uh -huh. you, if you could get in a time machine, go backwards, you know, what would you do? What would you do? And I got great advice, and uh, a lot of it was, you know, read everything you can, expose yourself to as much stuff as you can, uh, think critically about the movies you see, um, write as much as you can, you know, get all your bad writing done during college. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna do a lot of bad <laughs> writing, so right. get it all, you know, uh, what is it in bird by bird? You know, they say, uh, you know, they they talk about uh, the crappy first draft, um, <laughs> right. and. You know that everybody does them. Everybody has that. You know those uh, bad waffles. You know, as it were. You know the ones you have to just throw away. Um, so get those done in college. And then uh, the third piece of advice was like, come out to Hollywood as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I came out uh, bef uh, the between my uh, uh, yeah junior and senior years um, to work on uh, you know just to to, to write. 
and uh, you know, joke writing, stuff like that. Just basic, mm-hmm. basic writing. Finding comics, uh, ten bucks a joke. You know, writing their stand-up <laughs> routines, right? Uh, and stuff. So that was a ball. Um, wound up working on a movie as a clapper loader, a movie called uh, uh, Tiger Town for Disney. Uh, and that was fun because they got a, a real sense of the practicality of just how do movies come together. And I was working with this guy, Bob Ellswood, who's a, you know, now fantastic DP, award-winning uh, director of photography. But at the time, you know, he was just doing this Disney movie and uh, you know, taught me a lot of his lighting techniques. Um, I worked up from, what is it, uh, just distributing water <laughs> and sodas <laughs> on the set to being, you know, to being a clapper loader. So, uh, you know, I was Can you explain what a clapper loader is? Yes. A uh, clapper loader is the guy who, who holds the, um, the, the, the clapper, the, you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, what's the official term for that thing? I, I, I should know. Uh, the, the slate, yeah. Right. You, sl- you, um, <laughs> your job is basically to, uh, that the um, sound guy and the um, uh, uh, the director of photographer uh, 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 director of photography are on different kind of schedules. The sound guy has a certain amount of reels, uh, a certain way of marking, you know, what take is what. And so he would, I would race over to him, and he would give me his number, you know, reel mm-hmm. two forty five, take seven, you know, and then some code. I would write that on the slate, and then I'd run over to the DP, the director of photography, and he would say, "Okay, we're on. You know, this is Mag 17, um, uh, Mag 17, take. You know, and he would might have a different take number because he's also been shooting, you know, just stuff around the um, uh, around the set. So I'd write down what that was, and then uh, I would get more information from the script coordinator." I'd throw all that on the slate, and then I'd run over to the to the set, and then um, and then call the slate, you know, the scene and take number, and then clap it, uh, and sync up the film, you know, the film and the and the sound. So it was actually really fun because between takes, you know, between setups, they would need help setting up the lights, and they would need. You know, the sound guy would, would uh, you know, be coordinating with that. And as a student filmmaker, it was just fantastic because I got a, a sense of, like, just how little you really needed to mm-hmm. light a set beautifully. Right. You know, like, this guy was, we would sometimes just use uh, ambient light and a fill, you know, like a, a huge box with a um, kind of a, uh, a translucent um, uh, piece of paper. So a big styrofoam box with a translucent piece of paper he put a light on it, and sometimes that would be the only light that he would have, and that would just be to fill in the shadows. And then he would use the the regular light from the from the windows, you know, the, sometimes with a, a filter over the over the fat light, so that that and the and the you know, light that he had would balance out. And then he'd be done. And it gave the actors a lot of freedom to move around. It gave the sound guy a lot of freedom because there were no shadows were really going to come from it. Um, and you know, uh, so I went back to to to, to Syracuse and just was. Like okay, good. All my all my films looked beautiful, you know, because I've just been watching. I've been learning from yeah, the hands of the master all summer. It was great. Uh, yeah, very fun. Right. Uh, yeah, and so with with screenwriting, um, I said, you know, with the with the nine month clock, you know, nine month sort of Damocles swinging over my head, uh, I said, <laughs> I have nine months to do this. Let me figure this out. And uh, at the time. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter and Variety on Thursdays would list every production that was uh, going on in town, mm-hmm. and uh, and I said, okay, great. I nobody knows me. I'm a kid from Detroit. If I if I strike out with every production in town, it still doesn't matter. I'm just going to go back to Detroit, work, you know, work with my dad or whatever. Uh, so it's if everybody says no. No problem. It's it basically I am where I am now, which is you know I'm not doing anything. If one person says yes, great. I'm in the game and, and I can call my dad, and, you know, whatever, and right. and I and I'm fine. So I called every single production, uh, everything that was open, and I said um, uh, uh, my thing was because I didn't want everybody hanging up on me. I said, hey, <laughs> do you want to hear a joke or a piece of dialogue? <laughs> and, and that was my first thing. Like, hello, so and so production. Like, hey, do you want to hear a joke or a piece of gossip? Like, who who are you? Like, do you want to hear a joke or a piece of gossip? Like, um, yeah, joke. <laughs> you know, whatever. And I tell a joke. <laughs> or sometimes people would say a piece of gossip, and I tell them a piece of gossip, and, uh, and they'd say, oh, that's nothing. Hey, you wouldn't believe what happened on the set today. And then they would tell me a be- better piece of gossip. Right. And 
and they were like, well, so who are you? What do you want? I'm like, oh, don't worry about that. I'll call you tomorrow. And uh, <laughs> I'll call the next day. Joker piece of gossip. Oh, okay. Hey, you're that guy. Yeah, I was just talking about you. What do you know? <laughs> What's your deal, man? I'm like, look, I'm looking for a job. Um, you know, I just want to get something, anything out there. So if you have, have a PA job, if, you're, if your production assistant isn't doing – uh, just the perfect work, and you're just thinking, hey, I got a guy who has a joke a day <laughs> and is the <laughs> best gossip in town. I might be a better fit for you than, than the guy you have now. And I'm like, oh, that's a great take, dude, you know, whatever. So, um, uh, yeah, and I did I did that for, I think it was like, it only took me about three weeks. But remember, I'm making like 30 calls a day. I'm rotating through 60 productions every two days. So I call everybody every two days. And then at, at the end of about two, three weeks, um, they, I got three calls and people said, you know, hey, I, I got a job for you. And so I just took the best, the best offer, which at the time was uh, 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 CBS Radford in, um, in Studio City. And uh, I worked there. Uh, at night, let's see, days, I would kind of deliver uh, uh, office supplies. It was the worst job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a job that the janitor, you know, was like, oh, my God, you know, you got the worst <laughs> job in the world, you know. And so uh, I would I would do that by day, and then I would write all night. I figured if I wrote a page or two every night, I'd, get, I'd be ahead of the game. Uh, eventually, I had a, a, a really fun spec. Um, I Xeroxed it. Uh, and as I was delivering supplies or sodas, I would I would deliver my spec and the sodas, and I would say, Hey, here's you know here's uh, here are the you know your diet coke, and here's a uh, you know my script. Both are equally refreshing. And uh, <laughs> people were like, Oh, okay, get out, check it out. And, you know, most of them wound up in the trash, but some of them got read. Mm -hmm. And eventually, like people who were getting shows picked up were like, Oh, hey, I think I'm going to hire the guy in the soda shed. And and, uh, <laughs> and from that, like, you know, they called me up and said, you know, two guys, here's the story. Two guys were out to lunch, and uh, and they both said that they were going to hire me. And mm -hmm. uh, and so, it's like, they both kind of quickly paid the check, called me in my uh, at the shed and said, hey, kid, who's your agent? You know, I want to I make an offer. And I said, well, I don't have an agent. And he said, okay, you do now. I'm going to have my agent call you. And the other guy did the same thing great, you know, I'm going to give you a job. I want you, to, I want you to talk to my agent. And then all of a sudden, agents started calling me in the, tooth, in the, in the soda shed saying, <laughs> okay, who are you? <laughs> you know, who are, are you and why are you in play? You all of a sudden showed up on everybody's board as this, as this guy out of nowhere. Uh, could you meet with us before you make any decisions? And so uh, I'm 20 years old, and I had my choice between, like, you know, 10 agencies. Um, and uh, I went with the guys I, I liked the most. Uh, I started working right away. Called my dad. It was like four months in, and uh, four months. No guts for me, having... then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, no guts. Hey, sorry. Ha uh -huh. <laughs> You got to go after my little brother now, yeah. um, who is now in advertising. So funny. But uh, um, yeah, but that was that was it. I, I kind of I beat the clock. And um, uh, yeah, just had a had a great time. Uh, didn't look back. Okay. What well, what was the the you know first kind of gigs? What was that like? The first gig was um, actually it was funny. I I had this uh, uh, there was a show called Better Days on CBS, mm -hmm. and uh, it's notable not for the show itself because the show was canceled pretty uh, pretty quickly. The Thirteen Order, which to me. Uh, you know, as a, as a 20 year old kid, I thought, okay, great. A 13 year, thir an order for 13 episodes is better for me than an order for, say, six episodes or an order for three episodes, which a lot of shows were. They were a pilot plus two, and um, and so Better Days was, um, yeah, was just this show. They made a great offer. They were gonna uh, jump me a couple of ranks. Um, in TV, there's like you know you start off as a as a staff writer, then you move up to story editor, and then you move up to uh, I think it's uh, 
executive story editor, and then co-producer, producer, supervising producer, co-executive producer, executive producer. And it's like almost a military, right, where you just mm-hmm. ascend through the ranks every year. You can negotiate for a better title and better, you know, more money. And each each position has more and more authority. And uh, and they told me, hey, you don't have to start as a staff writer. You can just start right off as a, as a story editor and, um, and we'll give you a ton of money. I was like, oh, awesome! That'd be great. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, sure. so that was the that was at first the offer on the table, like, hey, you know, come in, write an episode, and we'll look at you for uh, as a staff writer. So I wrote my episode. They wound up hiring a team, uh, uh, two other people to do the job. Those two people turned in their draft at about the same time I turned in my draft, and everybody said, wow, this kid's draft is so much better than these veteran this veteran team of writers, why didn't we hire the other guy? And so they <laughs> quickly like fired the team that they had hired and then hired me. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I, that was my first gig. And uh, it was very fun, lasted for a little while. Um, when it got canceled, it was kind of like a weird for me, heartbreaking because we were working so hard on this, on the episode that we were doing. And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden they said, okay, guys, put your pencils down, go home. <laughs> it was like, oh no, you know, just devastating. And um, and so right after that, uh, the best thing in the world happened, which is all these guys had come from um, the Gary Marshall School of Comedy. So uh, Gary Marshall did uh, The Odd Couple and then oh, yeah, Happy sure. Days and yeah, Mork and Mindy and uh, you know uh, uh, Laverne and Shirley and uh, and all of these shows. And the his disciples are still doing shows. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I found that like having plugged into that energy, that, that group, that network, I was just working all the time. You know, uh, there was not a time when any of those guys were not working. In fact, most of the guys went, they took their boxes from, from, from that show, from better days, walked right over onto another show and then called me from the other show. And I wound up working, um, you know, right after that. So that now I know, I know you worked on Full House, then The yep. Fresh Prince of Bel Air, and then yeah. In Living Color. Can you talk a little bit about? Uh, I mean, is there any great stories from that time, or is there something that some insights you can give into to you know that kind of writing and writing for television? Oh yeah. Well, Full House. The funny thing was, it was. I'll start with the bad and with the good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Full House. The funny thing was, that, well, like, and, and I can say this now. But none of the writers watched the show. It was terrible. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it was a terrible thing. It was like it was always a good show. It was always very entertaining. We were working really hard on it. But when when the time came, we were all we would all trade stories about um, uh, married with children because mm-hmm. that was on at the same time, and that was a show that all the writers in Hollywood really really wanted to work on. <laughs> and the um, but the thing I did learn from Full House was that uh, uh, Jeff Franklin, who was who created it and ran it, had a rule which was, uh, geez, sorry about that, that's my agent. Yeah, but <laughs> uh, um, uh, Jeff Franklin, who was running the show, had a rule which was uh, you shouldn't write a joke that a uh, uh, that a person has to get. And I, mm-hmm. and I actually liked that a lot, you know, that, that there were no references, there were no, um, there was nothing that you had to kind of know in order to get the joke. The joke was right there in front of you. And, you know, even in, um, uh, again, because I'd also worked with Aaron Sorkin, and Sorkin said essentially the same thing, which was, you know, don't reveal stuff, you know, don't set up stuff in the first act that you, you know, you're not going to pay off until, you know, say the third act, you know, set it up show people what they need to know when they need to know it and then and then do it it's just more dramatic it's a much uh, more dynamic way of storytelling i love that mm-hmm. um on fresh prince fresh prince was interesting to me because nobody knew it was going to be a hit you know everybody was looking at it uh, in fact uh, andy and susan borowitz who created the show they had um they were more or less uh, uh forced onto the show because everybody was looking at oh there's will smith he's a rapper and rappers, they're violent and, you know, whatever. He's going to try to kill everybody. <laughs> and, and and I said, like, well, yeah, Will Smith is a rapper. Yeah, but he's he's a very, very, 
very soft, you know, very specific kind yeah. of rapper. He's not a gangster rapper. You know, he's a very popular uh, rapper. His stuff was about, you know, driving his mom's new Porsche. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, his roughest songs, kind of his parents don't understand. So, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and everybody was like, no, 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 he's a rapper. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> the writers were kind of running away from it. You know, writers are notoriously shy and kind of wimpy. <laughs> and uh, so people were running away from it, and I saw it, and I thought, oh, man, this kid is he's so charming. He's got great timing. He's, uh, you know, he's a natural, why do, you know, man, I, you know, this is going to be, this is going to be a blast. Of, of all the shows I saw that fall, you know, that show just looked like it was a, it was a no-brainer. Um, and fortunately for me, too, I, I, you know, I grew up in Detroit, but I also went to, a school that was very much like Bel Air Prep uh, in, in Michigan, a school mm-hmm. called Cranbrook, which is where uh, notorious now because Mitt and Ann Romney met uh, while attending Cranbrook. You know, oh. it's that kind of school. So, <laughs> so all of the jokes on Fresh Friends, the first season, about the school were right out of my experiences. <laughs> you know, uh, everything, the, the uniforms, the, the the things that were written on the doors, all of that stuff. I was the I was the main uh, research uh, research source. And um, uh, in fact, uh, friends of mine who I went to high school with are like, "Oh my God, you know, whatever you were just ripping our school off left and right." <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, yeah, so that was a blast. You know, I got to work with with Will, and and still friend with Will. Will Will is a, just an amazing guy, and and it obviously has grown, um, you know, way beyond anything that he did on 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 television, and uh, you know, but you could see it then. And the nicest guy in Hollywood, the absolute nicest guy in Hollywood. He will stop whatever he's doing to to talk to you for a good twenty minutes just to find out, you know, how you're doing and everything. Right. Amazing. Um, and Living Color was fun because. Uh, I was, I, I think I might have been the first writer that Keenan Williams hired on the show. And the big conversation was, okay, what are we going to do? What new ground are we going to um, seek out? And, uh, and, and we quickly came, up, <laughs> came to the thing like, there are no sacred cows. We're going to take everybody down. You know, Arsenio, <laughs> uh, you know, Mike Tyson, uh, uh, Reverend Farrakhan. We're, you know, we're hitting them all. There is no, nobody is safe here. And, uh, and, you know, just hit the ground running and just really, really, really just go do the things that nobody else could do on any of the other shows. You know, Saturday Night Live maybe has two black cast members at a time, usually mm-hmm. one. And this was the opposite. We had two white cast members. Right. Um, Jim Carrey. Now, the thing that's interesting, it, yeah, and, and the thing that's interesting from a filmmaking standpoint with both of these is that with... Uh, on Fresh Prince, when the first numbers came in, they were they were okay but not great, and uh, they had expected the you know the numbers to be much higher. They expected us to have Cosby numbers, and that was never going to be the case because we were a much younger show, a much more um, you know uh, we were just a different kind of show. We weren't the traditional show. This was right. hip hop. This was kind of a new thing going on, and the the audience wasn't readily available on 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 TV. So, um, so, so the numbers came in, and I just remember standing on the set with everybody looking, looking through Variety magazine at the numbers, and just saying, oh, "I'm sorry, guys. You know, I think we're all going to go home." And this was before the show had even, you know, uh, reached its third episode. Second episode, same thing, mm-hmm. didn't do well. Third episode did really well, and then everybody started to, like buying cars. But, um, but those those two weeks before the numbers broke were you know, were really painful. You know, we, we thought we thought we were doing a really good show. We were making ourselves laugh, and uh, and the network was just, you know, yeah, they were they were starting they were starting to not answer our calls and to to look at other <laughs> things to put in our put in our place. You know, you, you look back on it now, it's like oh, it's a TV classic. But at the time, right. we all thought, wow, you know, we 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 had done it all right. We had we had, we were making ourselves laugh. We were making our own favorite show. You know, um, Andrew mm-hmm. Stanton at Pixar, he always says, uh, you know, be a, be a film goer first, be a film maker second. And, um, and that, uh, that's what we were doing, not working. You know, it didn't seem to be working. Um, but it just took a little time for people to talk about it and to, to find it. And the same right. is true of uh, In Living Color. They, it started off as an hour-long series, and they cut it to an hour-long, to, what was it, a half-hour series, and then a 
hour special <laughs> and then a half hour special. And, and every time they saw another run through, they just cut it down again and again and again. And Keenan, to his credit, said, well, let's just, let's just shoot the material we have, which was about an hour and a half, and cut it down to a half hour special. But the executives were saying, we don't have anything. This is it. You know, we're just mm-hmm. going to. Um, it's not funny. And they were like, Rob, why do you think this is funny? I said, well, because, because it is really funny. You know? And fortunately their, 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 uh, their assistant was black and she was saying, I don't, I don't see why you guys don't think this is funny. And, uh, uh, the audience loads in, the audience laughs so hard. They were like stomping their feet, kind of laughing, you know, uh-huh. like jumping yeah. out of their seats and stuff, you know, <laughs> and, like <laughs> high-fiving kind of thing. <laughs> like, like just really a, furious, almost like church, like, oh, going nuts because it was so cathartic. And the yeah. executives turned to me and said, oh, you paid him to do that, didn't you? I said, no, it's, it's, <laughs> the, the show is actually funny. Just put it on the air. <laughs> you know? uh, but right. yeah, you're always sitting there kind of sweating it out before the thing actually comes on. Is that fairly common to be at odds with the, uh, you know, the executives and people who, who kind of don't get the humor? It is universal. It's, 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 it is every i've rarely had the other thing which is uh <laughs> you know where the executives are like hey we trust you it's going to be funny i love it you know right. they they're always uh a little bit worried and and even what is ed catmull at, at epixar he says uh uh you know with animation especially it's terrible before it's wonderful and with comedy the same thing sometimes you're kind of poking around and you're trying to find it and the good executives, you know, there are there, and there are there are some producers that are really truly wonderful that will say, "Look, you're going to find it. You know, you're funny. You've been funny before. You're you're going to be funny today. You know, you're not going to sit there. You know, you're not going to tank. So, uh, you know, what do you need? Do you need time, or uh, you know, do you need other resources? Whatever you need to do it, just go. Do your magic. You know, get in the room and go." And uh, other people will just sit there and they'll just, they'll, they'll completely clog your process with nervousness. And mm-hmm. they'll, and, and they're say, oh, this is just not going to work. It's like, oh, you know, whatever it is, they're just, it's terrible. And, yeah. uh, and, and they, and you're just always getting calls like, oh, shut it down, shut it down. And then, you know, you, you're always sitting there at a, uh, award ceremony with the same guys taking selfies saying, Oh, Hey, I always knew it. (laughs) So, so that's always the thing with a writer or anybody creative is that you, you're the one person that knows, um, uh, you're the one person that believes that can see it all in your head. And it's just a matter of convincing the horses that you've hired to, uh, you know, to, to, to have faith in you and to, and to, to let you keep going so that you can pull it off. Um, right. But yeah, no, it's 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 absolutely. I think maybe once or twice in 30 years, I've seen an executive who says, "Oh yeah, 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 this is gonna be fine." <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Do you have you ever done stand up or, or or do you just focus completely on you know? I mean, I know you do yeah. a lot of comedy, so I was just curious. Oh yeah, if you no, done I any... for me when I was uh, especially in college. Um, uh, one of the pieces of advice that I, I got was, you know, somebody, somebody said, Hey kid, are you, are you party funny or are you actually funny? And I said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, well, your friends think you're funny, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, good. That's a basic thing. Cause sometimes, you know, there are people who think they're funny and they don't know anybody who will laugh at their, <laughs> at the thing they say. <laughs> so, so you're, you're, you're in a good place, but can you go into a room full of strangers and tell a joke? Um, or seven, and uh, have them laugh at you. And I said, well, I, I really don't know. So, well, you should probably find that out before you try to make a living at, you know, doing this. <laughs> right. Like, like that, but it's, it's actually in the writing process, you know, the, the um, jo- especially in comedy, jokes are like words. You know, you, you are always, you need to come up with jokes on the spot, and a lot of the times jokes to replace the jokes that don't work, on Fresh Prince, I was famous for that. Where between takes, I would run on run onto the set and say, "Okay, I know that you know the 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 jokes that didn't work in the previous take. Here's why they didn't work, and here are better jokes." And uh, to be able to give Will and uh, you know uh, Alfonso Rivero, who played Carlton, um, uh, give them better jokes, uh, you know, in a second. 
uh, that mm-hmm. becomes a skill that you really, really need to develop. And the way you develop is through stand-up um, because there's nothing more terrifying. I, I can't, you know, I, I would think that jumping out of a plane or bungee jumping or something like that would be just a walk in the park compared to the feeling you get as you're walking onto the stage at the comedy shop, you know, at, at, at any comedy venue, um, right. you know, comedy store or the, or the improv or, or anything like that. There's that moment of terror, and you open your mouth, you introduce yourself, and you get that for free. You get your first joke for free, and then the next three jokes decide, you know, who you are. <laughs> you know, are you going right. to? Are you actually funny? Do they think? You know, specifically, do you have a a point of view that can get a laugh? That can get laughs consistently. You know, right. you see people like Amy Schumer, or Chris Rock, who have um, who have great points of view. As soon as they mm-hmm. start talking, you know exactly where they're going to come from, and and you just lean in and you smile, just just waiting to to laugh because oh I get that you know oh this is great this is going to be fantastic the setup is just so so wonderful and off they go, right and and, and yeah so for me I like I I uh, I was a. Uh, a semi shy kid. I mean, <laughs> nobody ever believes that I'm shy, whatever. But but when I was a kid, I was I was I was pretty shy. And then um, uh, and just the idea of doing jokes, you know, no no music, no nothing. I, I'm not sitting behind an instrument or or whatever. I'm just getting up and telling jokes. Uh, that's terrifying. So uh, yeah, I did that all through college, and um, just had a blast with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, first time up was 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 nerve wracking, and then after that. It was a ton of fun. I would, uh, and for me, I, I took a, a very writer approach. I would grab a newspaper and uh, you know just see what were the topics, the best topics that I could joke on. And so I always had new jokes. Every set I would do, uh, I, I didn't do two, any two sets the same. So if I mm-hmm. did three sets in a week, I would do three different three different sets. Usually the same introduction and the same ending, but the middle of it was you know, hey, let's talk politics or let's talk, you know. Uh, now, would you would you have everything there. ready before you came on stage, or were, are you talking about you would actually read the newspaper while you were doing like was it kind of right. improvised? Like well, that? there was there, there's that Mort Saul kind of thing, you know, where he would do that. Oh. He would just read the newspaper and and, and, <laughs> yeah. and speak. It was amazing. I, I saw him once, and I thought, like, okay, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> but, but but I had started, you know, in college. Remember, I, I started as a joke writer, so my ten bucks a Ten bucks a joke uh, thing. That still, I still do that. I'll, I'll walk into a meeting and I'll have jokes actually written before I walk into a meeting, um, uh, just because I don't want to fall on my face. So I would right. have some that were written out, like you know, a good. If I was gonna, yeah, if I was gonna play around, I'd have like five jokes, you know, warm people up to a topic, and then I would, uh, and then I would play, you know, once I got comfortable with it. I would play around and I would give myself a good, you know, I don't know, three minutes of just goofing off. Three minutes <laughs> right. of a ten minute set of just, you know, let me just goof off. Let me, let me you know, it's, uh, Halloween's coming up, so what jokes do I have? Or, you know, uh, Valentine's Day, that was always fun. And, you know, and sometimes right. the audience will, the audience will give you stuff. You'll say, "Oh, what's your what's your least favorite thing about Thanksgiving?" And everybody will start talking. You're like, "Oh yeah, right." Boom, 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 and you can just jump in and and let your mind go and kind of you know improv with the audience. And it's really right. fun because the audience is you know the audience relaxes to you. They really start to get you. And um, um, and for for me, I it was I was. The main thing I was trying to do is just tune into what is funny about me. What, where can I pull jokes uh, from right. that will mm-hmm. be consistently funny? And uh, you know, uh, yeah, my point of view on on stuff. And that was that became the Fresh Prince point of view. It, it was very much the Princess and the Frog point of view. Um, when I was working with Aaron Sorkin on Studio Sixty, that was you know uh, I, I was writing the uh, the um, uh, sketches. On, on that show, and that's where I was pulling, you know, my, my point of view from. Um, mm-hmm. I've written magazine articles, uh, you know, same kind of thing. My voice is pretty much what I what I developed while I was doing stand up, uh, uh, and I, I recommend that for anybody, everybody who who considers themselves funny and who wants to write uh, comedy. 
Um, don't, you know, do all your suffering, you know, <laughs> where it doesn't cost anything. You just get up and you do it. And in five minutes, you, you know, you tape your, your performance. You absolutely know what's funny and what's not. As opposed to right. spending three months writing a screenplay and getting things circled or whatever, um, you know that's it. Just takes too long. You can go up three times a week, and in that in that time, you can find out everything you need to know. Mm-hmm. Now, when you're, I, I really want to talk about um, Treasure Planet, sure, because um, I have a seven year old son. Oh, oh great, and, great. <laughs> and the funny thing was, you know. For whatever reason, I never read Treasure Island as a kid. You know, it was probably kind of this big thing that I missed out on, but I had never seen it. So my first real connection with Treasure Island was watching Treasure Planet. Oh, cool. <laughs> and I That's absolutely, no, that, I was really, I mean, I absolutely loved that movie. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, see me too. I, I probably I, like I, it more than my son does. I mean, he, he loves it too, but I'm, I'm like, you know, I just think it's so well made. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, and I think it'll, it'll be interesting for your son, too, that, that as he goes back and launches it again, uh, what I find is that, you know, because now uh, the movie is about, what, 15 years old? And, and now... 2002. Um, yeah, right, exactly. So, so people, are, um, people are kind of rediscovering it mm-hmm. as they're older, and they're understanding, you know, they, they're, they get it first as a kid, uh, you know, seven or eight years old, and then they'll start getting it as, as a teenager, and they'll say, "Oh, okay, I I see now. Wow, this is so much deeper than I thought." I, I just got a, a text from my son uh, about two days ago. He's uh, at uh, Loyola University in Baltimore, and he said, "Hey, they're playing Treasure Planet in the break room, and uh, and the room is full, and you know, I'm really proud of you right now." <laughs> you know? and, and so it's, it's playing in the break room in college, and that was like, "Okay, great. That's why I wrote the movie." Um, so my son could walk <laughs> by and say, "Hey, my dad wrote that," and, and <laughs> yeah. But but all the yeah. time you're trying to write your your own favorite movie, and it was Ron Clements's uh, Ron Clements and John Musker uh, uh, directed the movie, and mm-hmm. their thing was we want to bring this wonderful book, this this great you know Robert Louis Stevenson book, to the to a modern audience, and have them. Uh, you know, uh, experience the wonder and the, you know, the, the emotional depth of, uh, of that movie, uh, you know, just like you did, uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and kind of have a respect for the book. Maybe some people would go back and, and, and read the book. Um, others would just kind of just see the story for what it was, this very, you know, wonderful kind of almost father and son story, um, and, and get the adventure of, you know, uh, outer space, uh, uh, that would replace the, the kind of adventure that, that was had generations ago about like, oh, pirates in the, in the sea. Uh, you know, nobody thinks, oh, I'm going to have excitement. I'm going to get on a boat. You know, people don't think that anymore. <laughs> you know? right. So you have to kind of heighten it. And so you have, yeah, laser guns and cannons and, you know, uh, all that stuff. And then just, just really have fun with the creatures and, and, and everything. Right. It was so much fun to write. And, uh, and for me, it was my first Disney movie. Um, uh, you know, since then I've, I've man, I've worked on a, a ton of stuff, but, uh, uh, but yeah, it's just whatever you think, you know, as a writer, think, think about it, whatever you think you can write it down and then you would see drawings of whatever you had thought, you know, the most amazing <laughs> Disney artists would, would draw this stuff. So, so you'd have a, here's a creature with eight eyes and I would say, Hey, I wonder what kind of binoculars, a creature with eight eyes would have, you know, and I would kind of like right. draw my little terrible, you know, I had a comic strip in high school, so I would, I would draw my little terrible thing, and I'd see it back a couple hours later, and it would be fully rendered with, you know, these just amazing <laughs> artwork, and uh, yeah. so much better and funnier than anything I thought. It was just a fantastic experience, you yeah. know. How, how do you, how's that collaboration um, when you're working with other writers and you're you know, I mean, are you guys all, do you all go off and work on things on your own and then come back? Or, or is it just like a, a room where you're kind of giving ideas? Because, I mean, I know you've probably worked a lot in collaboration. And for me, I, I've never worked in collaboration, so I don't really, I don't know how that really works. Oh, it's 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 amazing. I, I think everybody should try it. Uh, uh, it. It is, it is not, it is not easy. Um, uh 
when I started writing the same thing, I would always write by myself. Uh, and specifically, I'd write in the middle of the night um, uh, and in the mornings when nobody was even awake. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I like that feel. I like, I like kind of relaxing and seeing, seeing the environment that I'm writing. Um, you know, the, the characters come to life in front of me, and the, the, I can see the walls and the props and everything, and I'm just kind of writing as fast as I can um, to keep up with them. And uh, uh, and in a collaborative environment like television or or you know uh, movies and now like pretty much all movies, you're there and um, and you just have to let go. You just have to say, okay, well there are there are I have 20 ideas for you know good versions of this movie, and the guy across from me who's writing the check, you know, who's paying my bill, <laughs> he has maybe 15, maybe, you know, maybe 10. And my job is to find the four or five in the middle that work for both of us. You know, mm. there are, there's this, you know, you, you, you figure like that, that my 20, there's a circle, and then his 15, there's a circle. The two circles are going to converge at some point. And there are going to be these ideas in the middle that, that will work for everybody. So my, my job is to not fight for the, the 15 that are going to just go down in flames that I'm never going to sell to that guy. And his job, hopefully, is to give up on you know, the, the five that he's, he's going to have to uh, sacrifice. And then we'll work super hard on the five that are in the middle. And we may go through all five of those until we find the best one. But there will be a best one that everybody can, can work on. And um, and that everybody will bring something to. So on uh, Princess and the Frog, you go up to Pixar, and the best guys in the world are giving you notes. You know, John Lasseter and Andrew Stanton, who directed uh, you know Wally and and uh, Finding Nemo, and you've also got Pete Doctor, who did you know um, uh, uh, Monsters Inc. Right? Sorry, Monsters or Inc. And yeah, exactly, and the, and the new one. Um, and all of these, you know, Brad Bird, all these guys are, are, are giving you notes. And the way they give you notes is <laughs> they say, you know, and, and so you, you, it's like, it's like, you know, uh, from, from on high, right? The tablets come down. You know, this is what Brad right. Bird has to say about your movie. But, um, but, but you're, you, what they're doing is they're saying, if it was my movie and I was personalizing it, this is what I would do. And they walk, it, walk you through it. Right. And your job is to say, Okay, here's how I am like Brad Bird, and here I, here's how I am not like Brad Bird, you know. And um, so I am completely in tune with Brad Bird up until he said this, but I see what he what he is offering, and I can do something with that. If I try to work on the other idea, it's going to seem inorganic. It's going to seem just like I'm just trying to do. I'm trying to imitate Brad Bird. Um, mm-hmm. So I go at that point. I go into my little cave. And I write something, and I show it to everybody, and I say, "Well, this is what, this is what I came out of the, the meeting with. This is what I think Brad is talking about. This is the execution of that idea, and this is what I think Andrew was talking about. He was talking about character and the huge arc of it. Here is my, you know, here are my five points on how I think, how I think those changes will lay out. And you know, when Pete Doctor started talking about this." At first, I didn't really get it, and then I started thinking about the movies that he was talking about, and I watched them all, and uh, I came up with, with these things when I went to my cave. And that's, and that's kind of the fun of it, because everybody else will do the same thing. The directors will say, you know, we get this, we get that, um, we're going to use these things, we're going to try to, you know, uh, uh, let's, none of us believe in this idea, but there was some some excitement around it when it was pitched. So let's just keep it alive for a little while longer. Uh, you know, maybe we can attach something to it that'll make it work. Maybe we can't and we'll just throw it out, but let's keep it alive for a little while. Um, and a lot of times that's the game you're playing. You're, you're, you're trying to have the movie resonate with as many people as humanly possible. Um, you know, you want more people to buy tickets. You want to be able to do it again. Uh, at the same time, the only way that people are it's truly going to resonate it's truly going to be great is if it comes from your your own personal heart your own personal um experiences mm-hmm. and okay. uh you know that it, it 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 has to kind of walk the line between being an independent film and uh and a huge you know popular film that if it's if it's cloying, you know, if it's if it's just like, oh look, we're just going to say everything that everybody agrees with, that's not going to work at all. 
And if, right. if it's too obscure that, that nobody's going to get it, you know, you're going to, you're going to die there too. So a film like inside out, um, it's, it is very, very unconventional, but, uh, and the way that it's telling stories, it's, it's entirely theoretical, but the emotional, uh, you know, what's happening emotional in, in that movie. If you went and talked to Pete doctor, I'm sure he would, um, he would tell you, yes, exactly. That's how I feel. Um, mm-hmm. when I see treasure planet, uh, I cry every <laughs> at the last part, you know, when they're, when they're saying goodbye, I always cry. Uh, yeah. when I watch, uh, 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 princess and the frog, I've now seen it like way too many times. I've seen it like 20, 30 <laughs> times. And uh, there was a point where I kind of have to leave because I, I, I would just, I just burst into tears. Uh, right. uh and I knew, I, I knew that that would happen when I was writing it because that's why I was writing it. I was writing mm-hmm. it you know, for myself and for my best friends and hoping that, uh, okay, you know, if I write this, if I do this correctly, uh, there won't be a dry eye in the house. And I remember the first screening we had uh, of that. And there was a moment, the moment came up and it, c- it could have just been people going, oh, come on, you know, whatever, throwing popcorn at the screen. <laughs> but instead, like, the room got very, very quiet. And then all of a sudden, I just started hearing sniffling. And then I started hearing, like, people, uh, uh, like, like tissues, you know, whatever. The, the sound right. of a lot of tissues kind of just coming out. And, uh, and <laughs> I can just imagine that. You're like, mm, Yeah, okay. just, like, people sniffling. And, like, uh, one screen I went to, like, someone was, like, open mouth crying. You know? <laughs> and, and, then, and I was You're like, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was I was joking around with a friend of mine who was like, you know, what was he? The guy's seventy five years old. Took him to it, and uh, a screening at the El, El Capitan, and um, and I was joking around like, oh yeah, it's for kids, and don't worry about it. And I turned to him, and he was just crying his eyes out. <laughs> this is this is beautiful. And I said, okay, that's it. That's exactly what you want to do, right? Your job is to touch hearts. Is to right. is to have it be cathartic and wonderful and and uh, magical, and uh, you know that that's that's when you're when you're in the zone as a storyteller. Uh, you know people are laughing, great, you've connected to them, and then you cry. You've touched their hearts in some way. You've changed the way they they think about something. You know you reintroduce them to magic. You know, and in in the case of Treasure Planet, you've made them believe in this uh, uh, relationship of. Characters that are drawn by hand, you know, (laughs) where somebody sat down with a pencil and drew uh, this guy a million times and that that is moving you to tears is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, it really was something that stood out in Treasure Planet, you know, that relationship and the fact that, um, you know, the Long John Silver character wasn't, you know, he wasn't just this i mean he was he was he had dimension to him you know what i mean exactly yeah and he he was like actually and i you know to this day i still haven't read the book so i don't know how much is in the book (laughs) i always say yeah i know treasure treasure island but i'm actually referring to treasure planet most of the time it's like yeah remember that time with the the spaceship and they're like that yeah exactly exactly. (laughs) hey uh, excuse me you know how it starts (laughs) and he's like riding on the sail and he's like in the sky and the robots remember the robots they're like no yeah right (laughs) that's not in treasure island sorry Awesome. But um, yeah, yeah well, that, well, that, that was, relationship. Yeah, Sorry, and that was the big debate on that movie was that the uh, effects tend to. I, I think with with Ron, uh, Ron Thomas' favorite movie was Star Wars, and I share that with him. And we're both Trekkers, so that was fun too. So we we had this dialogue uh, back and forth. And there is a tendency in movies like this, and, and even other movies, you know, in, in the um, uh, all of the comic book movies that are going on now, a lot of the science fiction movies that happen, a lot of times people get uh, um, taken away with what they can do, what the, you know, the machinery that they can do and the, how fast the spaceships go and what kind of weaponry you, you, you do. And that's always a big part of it. But, but for me, I said, this movie, the, the, the best scenes of this movie uh, will be the, the old man and the kid just talking. And everybody mm-hmm. said, "Oh, you're messing with me, man." You know, whatever. I'm like, no, it's never going to be it. It's going to be this scene and this fight scene and whatever. We got this thing choreographed to it within an inch of his life. And I said, "I, I think, you know, look, I'm the writer talking. I know that, but I think it's going to be this guy and this, these two people 
just talking and the conversations. And I'll tell you what the conversations are. You know, it's the guy, it's them sharing their dreams. It's the guy, basically, like there's one of my favorite scenes in it uh, is when, when Jim thinks he didn't tie the ropes correctly and this group has kind of set him up. And, right. uh, and, and, you know, Silver knows what's going on. And he sees that he's just broken this kid. And he says, and, and, we, and this was like weeks and weeks, I think it was months and months and months, uh, you know, the guys and Roy Connolly, who was a producer, and, and I just talking and talking and talking. We were saying like, okay, these are two tough guys. These are two guys who come from the same, you know, same side of the street. How would a guy tell another guy like that, that he loves him and he's, you know, that, that, that he's there for him? And it was like, you know, oh, you're going to rattle the stars, you know, whatever, you know, and I won't want to be there for you, just watching, you know, whatever. And, 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 and that was it. Like, look, I'm going to be around, you know, you're going to be great. I'm going to be there when you're great. And, uh, uh, you know, I want to be on this, I want to be on the journey. This is a, this is just a minor setback. So don't, mm -hmm. you know, don't let it, whatever. And the conversation, and the way that happened was everybody talked about what it was, what did their father say to them? That was the most important thing in the world their father had ever said. And right. and it's it's your father saying, That was awesome. I think you're gonna be really great at whatever it is. what the gravity of the special effects are around it. No, that's the scene. That's, that's, you know, that's it. Yeah. And then when they say goodbye, it's like, Oh, geez, you know, I uh, was thinking about it, <laughs> you know, but that's, that's the thing I'm writing. I'm, uh, people would pass by my office and I'd just be bawling. And, uh, they'd say, are you okay, man? <laughs> like, no, I'm great. <laughs> you know? I am I'm a great seeing, writer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm brilliant. But like, I'm I'm seeing this movie. I'm seeing the movie that you're going to see in a couple of years, um, yeah. uh, right now. And I think it's I think it's great. I think if we don't blow it along the way. It's going to be great. And that's uh, you know going back to even collaboration and everything. Everybody shares that little dream of. Uh, you know, if we can execute this right, if we can plus this thing, you know, Rob has given us the raw material. He's given us the book, and um, you know, these these, these wonderful these, these lines and the staging, and I think this can work. And if we draw it right, if the performances are right, if we record the voices right, if the music is right, if we edit it right, if we lay it out correctly so that we we're not in the way of it, if the scoring, the music is uh, works out, then there won't be a dry eye in the house. And uh, and all of that is the, the, the joy of collaboration because everybody is making it better than I than than the, the words on the page, you know everything is enhancing that, and you know that's it's just great teamwork. Yeah. Right. Now, can you talk a little bit about your creative? I, mean, I hate to say the creative process, but how you know over the years, I'm sure that you've learned kind of how your brain works and how you get into that groove and how you actually create stuff. I mean, it sounds to me like, you know, I, I write as well. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. And I, I think I can understand like kind of where your mindset is in that part of you is writing and kind of improvising in a way. And you're, you're, you're kind of watching the movie in your head and writing it down. And part of you is also reacting to that. And yeah. you're kind of like writing something and you're feeling how, you know what I mean? It's kind of that dichotomy of, of doing two things at the same time. 
exactly. Well, and, and I try to. Uh, I'm notorious for trying to not do the two things at, at one time. Uh, in fact, the, the 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 place where I get in trouble with most people is that people say, "What software?" Do you use during the creative process? I just got asked that question. <laughs> I, was in, I, was, I was in Marseille, France, and at a at a tech conference, at a you know a web fest, and uh, it was three days ago. And the guy asked me, um, you know, what what you know what software do you use? And I said, I don't. I don't use any software. I just when I'm when I'm composing, when I'm in the creative flow, the tools get in the way. So I have a pad and a pen. Um, uh, and uh, I have a pad and pen, and I, I'm just writing down everything that I think will be cool in the movie. Just cool scene after right. cool scene after cool scene. I'm not stopping myself. I'm overwriting. I'm just, I'm just having fun. When I, when I, there's a little piece of the scene I can't think of. I just, I just say, say brilliant thing happens here, and then I move on to the <laughs> section you know, that I know, right. and then I just, I, I just keep going. I just stay in a flow, and I'm just getting the ideas down. And then mm-hmm. I sit down, um, and I've gotten into this terrible habit <laughs> because it's just it looks terrible, which is I sit down with Post-it notes, and I put the ideas on Post-it notes, and then I put them on my uh, on my door, mm-hmm. and my door is basically the the storyboard for the whole movie. So the you know where the um, where the knob is 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 the midpoint of the movie, <laughs> you know the floor is the end <laughs> of the third act, and the you know and the the the, the top of the thing is you know the, the the set up the first scene and you know whatever midway through that thing there's going to be a you know a break into the first act and you know the second act and all that stuff it's all kind of okay great that's that's the door that's the flow of the movie. Now I sit down with the ideas that I've had and the cool scenes and I say okay where should that be in the movie. And that's ex- an extremely technical part of it because I'm saying, okay, well, there's some things that I want to have in the setup portion and, uh, and that's going to be at the top of the door. And then some things I want to have in the payoff portion. So that's going to be towards the bottom and the more spectacular scenes, I'm going to put all towards the bottom of the uh, bottom of the door. And the, um, and you know, uh, for every card that I'll have at the bottom of the door, I want to make sure it's set up. So I'll make another, uh, I'll make another post it and I'll put that up on top. And the first time through, just kind of, I'm just randomly, I'm just throwing stuff up on the door. Uh, and then, um, and then I sit down with it and I say, okay, great. I'm watching the movie now. Now I'm a third person and mm-hmm. I want to set it up. So, okay, here's this character. Here's what this character is great at. Here are this character's character flaws. Okay, good. Now I'll set this guy up. Okay, good. Now I want to incite you know, I want to have an inciting incident. So what is the best way to kind of rattle the cage of this guy? How can I take away his power base? You know, how can I, uh, you know, in, in uh, The Incredibles, right? Bob Parr is the world's greatest uh, superhero. And then being a superhero is made illegal. Great. You know, inciting <laughs> right. incident. You know, so it just yanks the thing out, you know, uh, uh, Lightning McQueen in, in, in cars. He's taken, you know, he's not allowed to race. He's got a boot on his foot. You know? um, so, <laughs> right. so you yank that thing away. So how can I do that? That's, that's great and dramatic and going to start the story. Boom. Okay, well, that's at about eye level. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm working with that. So I want to have that. I want to have him react to that. And then I want to have a decision made as to, as to how I'm going to move forward. And that's going to be my break into act, act two. Um, then I'm going to have a ton of fun with it, you know, around my, my chest area, you know, at about my <laughs> belt buckle. Uh, that's going to be my midpoint. I'm going to try to shift as many of the dynamics as I can, uh, come out of that. And then I'm basically building to the end, I'm building to the climax. So I'm setting up the antagonist. Um, or I'm, 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 uh, ha- I have the antagonist at the height of his powers. The antagonist is that, at that point going to take over the story and win. That's going to be my end of act two. And then, uh, I'm going to just kind of try to write the, or try to um, imagine the most dynamic, uh, cathartic third act that I can. Right. But all the while through, I'm just, I'm giving myself assignments. I'm saying, okay, what's the best way to set up this character? Now I'm just going to go and write. I'm just going to free write and, and write a bunch of fun stuff. And, uh, you know, some of it may survive, some of it may not. I'm just going to stick it in a pile. Uh, but, but really, all the time, I'm just looking at structure. You know, how can I make this movie flow? Because the worst thing you can do is go with a good idea too long. You know, mm-hmm. it's like we've all been in, in those movies where like, oh, I was laughing and laughing. And then, oh, no, 
this just <laughs> fell apart entirely. You know? I mean, I don't want to rag right. it, but, but like Superman, the, the new Superman, right? There's that. Right. It's just zooming along. The guy's on a on a ship. He's run away from the thing. It's like, oh, awesome. His mom, his relationship with it. He, he, he puts his fist in the dirt and he goes flying. And I'm like, oh, this is great. This is the best movie ever. And then about 10 minutes later, I'm like, what? what wait, what happened? <laughs> you know, all the momentum is gone. They've they've overused the idea of just setting him up like you know it, it's a it's an hour long first act, and I'm uh, I'm I was excited beyond belief, and now I'm bored stiff. And what happened? And that's just that's just craftsmanship. That's just are you mm-hmm. making are you making a good cabinet? You know, can right. you do the doors swing open the right way? Are they balanced? Um, is it uh, you know, are there enough shelves or, or have you thought about it wrong? Um, all of that stuff is in the planning. And then the art is, you know, yeah, let yourself be an artist. Uh, but that's the thing that I, I think a lot of people just plain old forget uh, is, is the, the raw um, uh, mathematics of storytelling. Right. Um, you know. Uh, is there is there and, a specific movie that you think of in terms of like where where do you go to mentally when you're coming up with structure for for you know everything? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, uh, my thing is uh, different things for different projects. Uh, okay. That uh, I, I I there's something I call a structural cousin. You know, so whenever <laughs> I'm, I'm I start on into a movie, I'm looking for a uh, uh, yeah what what movies do I like that are like this. So, um, you know, with Treasure Planet, uh, I went to, uh, uh, what was it? Jeez. Um, actually, <laughs> this is terrible. Of all the Treasure, Treasure Island uh, uh, movies, I actually liked mm-hmm. Muppet Treasure Island a lot because <laughs> <laughs> it was just so smooth and it was like, oh, perfect. You know, it, it, it didn't, it, it just told the story. It was right. great. And, Did you uh, ever see the 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 um, Fraser Heston one, um, which was the one with uh, Charlton Heston? Yes, exactly. I saw them all. I saw okay. them all. Because I, I did an interview on... with him too, and I was I kept talking to him about Treasure Planet during the interview. <laughs> oh, funny. Got annoyed. Oh, funny. Oh, great, great. <laughs> that was okay. Good. No, I totally agree. <laughs> so, yeah, but the the uh, uh, yeah, because for me, I just wanted to see. Okay, how has this story been told? And who has told it well? Because it's a, right. you know, it's a big book. It's got it, you know, books are gangly, and uh, you know, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so I was looking at looking at all of those. And then, um, and then in there, there's a movie called Captain Courageous. I don't know if you know that mm-hmm. one. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and and it's it's just a brilliant movie. It's it's very similar in storytelling to to, to this one, and um, and it was, you know, just. That was when I said, okay, it's just about these two characters. It is all, all about these two characters and the emotional depth between them. Because, uh, you know, you're crying all the way through that movie. And it's, you know, the old sea, you know, Spencer Tracy's the old sea, sea guy. And then this kid who's just wonderful, uh, you know, trying to be tough. And he learns, he becomes a man during it and, and just great. So there were key scenes from that that I said, okay, I'm I'm going to – uh, steal as much as humanly possible from it, from that movie, <laughs> and then kick the dirt over the tracks. You know, I'm going to make it my own, but I'm going to I'm going to start from where they ended, and uh, build off of that, so that I'm I'm starting with great, and I can't help but wind up with even greater by the time I'm done, um, mm-hmm. because I've now personalized it and I've kind of made it made it into into this. I've absorbed what's what's great about that. And uh, you know whatever years they took to write it, and then boom, I've, got, I've done that. Uh, with um, with Princess and the Frog, I, I, I looked at a lot of the um, uh, princess movies, and I said, boy, there is no way in the world. Like I coach soccer, you know, um, and the girls on the girls' soccer teams are amazing. You know, even the five year olds and six year olds and whatever, and and, and I'm sure you know, with your son, you, you see these girls who are fully capable of playing on the boys' teams, and they are uh, they're just a different breed of of, of human being than mm-hmm. Disney had to deal with in the 50s. So the the notion of a girl saying, "Oh, I'm in love with a prince. He's throwing a ball. I have to go there," you know. That's never going to resonate with anybody, any human being <laughs> alive today. Um, uh, you know, the guy's going to have to earn it. And so we we talked about all kinds of movies that we were going to uh, that 
that we wanted to screen. For me, it was uh, Wedding Crashers because I just really love that movie. <laughs> um, and how can you, you know, just structurally, it was just a wonderful movie. And then the yeah. movie, it happened one night, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, again, with, with, with Claudette, you know, and what if you took the Claudette Colbert part and made that the guy and took the, you know, um, and, and took the, uh, uh, geez, the male part, I'll remember just saying, but you yeah, took that and then Clark switched Gable. them up. Clark Gable, thank you. Uh, if you took the Clark Gable part and switched it so that uh, she is the one that's capable. She's the one that says, yeah, oh, you've never fried an egg. You know, you don't know what, you know, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, uh, you don't know how to, uh, you know, uh, hitchhike or anything like that. And made, um, made him be kind of, you know, uh, uh, lost at sea, uh, very, you know, he, he's a prince. He's never done anything before. And so that was our structural, structural cousin for that one. And so anytime we were even remotely lost, we would screen the movie again and say, okay, what did they do mm-hmm. during this part of the movie? Oh, great, this is the scene where they're, they've got the curtain between them and they're sharing their dreams. That's a great idea. You know, why, did, you know, why don't we do something like that? Um, and, you know, so, so that becomes the scene where, uh, where uh, Tiana's telling uh, the prince for the first time about her restaurant. And, um, and uh, in that scene, the best thing that happens is that, that the, uh, they find out like he makes a sacrifice. He decides not to do, uh, not to ask her out. He decides to go, um, you know, race on ahead uh, right after that sequence. And so, so we did the same thing. They're 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 on the paddle boat and they they're looking out at the restaurant. And she starts sharing her dreams about the restaurant. He's fully ready at that point to ask her, you know, to to propose to her, and he chooses not to, and he goes off and does that. And it gave us this really fun dynamic in the story. Um, you know, nobody, I think one French journalist during the, <laughs> during the press tour said, do you, does this have anything to do with it happened one night? I was like, thank you. you know, <laughs> thank you so much. Was, okay. It happened one night and, um, and Royal wedding, right? I said, yes, exactly. Oh, no. Well, it's simple. It's all that old thumb, see? Yeah. Now some people do it like this or like this. All wrong. Never get anywhere. Oh, the poor thing. Yeah, boy, but that old thumb never fails. It's all a matter of how you do it, though. You know, now, you take number one, for instance. That's a short, jerky movement like this. That shows independence. You don't care whether they stop or not. You got money in your pocket, see? Clever. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, but number two, that's a little wider movement. Smile goes with this one like this. That means you got a brand new story about the farmer's daughter. Mm Mm-mm. You figured that out all by yourself. Huh? Nah, that's nothing. Yeah, number three, that's a pit. Yeah, that's a pitiful one. You know, when you're broke and hungry and everything looks black. That's a long sweeping movement like this. Got to follow through though. Oh, that's amazing. Hmm. Yeah, but it's no good though if you haven't got a long face to go with it. Here comes the car. Okay. Now watch me. I'm going to use number one. Keep your eye on that thumb, baby, and see what happens. Got my eye on the thumb. Something must have gone wrong. Oh. Try number two. Mm. Well, when you get to a hundred, wake me up. The classics are what the classics are. You know, those are great storytellers. Yeah. Um, you know, telling fantastic stories. So why not? You know, just watch the movie. Uh, uh, internalize it. Internalize its its level of storytelling, and then tell your own story from that. You know, you're doing it anyway. You're just doing it unconsciously. So, uh, you know, realize what, what makes it great. Officer and Gentleman had a big part to play in, in Treasure Planet. You know, there are, there are a lot of scenes, you know, not directly, not the dialogue or anything like that, but like, why, mm-hmm. why, is, this, why is this scene so compelling? Why is it that when, you know, um, uh, when, when Mayo is just getting, you know, terrorized by this guy, why do you love them both so much? And that mm-hmm. led to, you know, uh, a, a sequence in, in Treasure Planet where he's making him, you know, wash the dishes and all that stuff. And the thing that we got, the payoff of that sequence in, in, in Officer and the Gentleman was that, that Zach Mayo does everything so great. You know, he's just so, um, you know, I mean, he's got no place to go, obviously, but, but he's, he's just a great soldier. And uh, uh, because he wants to advance so much, he wants to just be a, a great, you know, um, 
a great soldier. Why would a slick little hustler like you want to sign up for this kind of abuse anyway? I want to fly jets, sir. My grandmama wants to fly jets. I want it since I was a kid. We're not talking about flying here. We're talking about character. I've changed. I've changed since I've been here. Hell, you have. I've changed, sir. No. You just polished up your ass a little bit. You just shined it up. Now tell me what I want to hear. I want your D-O-R. No, sir. I want your D-O-R. I ain't gonna quit. Spell it. D. Oh, oh, I ain't gonna quit. Yeah, then you can be free and you and your daddy can get drunk and go hall chasing again, huh? No, sir! D-O-R! I ain't gonna quit! All right, then you can forget it. You're out! Don't you do it! Don't you! I got nowhere else to go! I got nowhere else to go! And so, uh, uh, so for us, we had, you know, that, that here is, here's Jim and Jim is asleep, you know, but he's asleep scouring a, a pot. And when, you know, when, when uh, <laughs> Silver looks around, he sees like, oh my God, this kid has done every single dish in this thing. And everything is just spotless. It's all shimmering. You know, um, it's time to reward him. And so he lets him pilot the, the boat for the first time. Um, right. uh, so that's, you know, I, I don't know how long it would have taken me uh, just organically to come up with something like that. I'm sure a year or two later, you know, <laughs> I may have stumbled upon that. But the idea of having a, a movie that's kind of a lodestar where you can, you can, if you ever get lost, you just open up the map and, and look at it is a great thing. Right. With, with Aladdin, uh, Aladdin and Thief of Baghdad, if you look at those two movies side by side, you know, you'll be amazed it, with Cars and Doc Holliday. If you look at those two, you know, again, um, uh, that that uh, most filmmakers will do it. Uh, some don't admit to it, but but there's nothing wrong with being a big fan of cinema, and mm-hmm. uh, and then building your cathedral on the shoulders of giants. Do you ever like if you're writing a movie and you know another movie is kind of like like you're saying, you know the. Um... It happened one night, or, or those movies. Do you watch those movies and then have original ideas while you're watching that movie? Oh yeah, all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, I mean that that's one of the things that that I wanted to to see because you know I always talk about like I'm I'll write I'm I'm doing kind of more horror kind of movies, but you know right. hopefully horror movies that are well written. You know what I mean? And so yeah. what I'll do is I'll watch some of the movies that are kind of similar. And I'll I'll get just amazing ideas that have nothing to do with the movie I'm watching, but it's just somehow being in that space, you know what exactly. I mean? Like exactly. starts giving you ideas. Yeah, no, I knew an artist at uh, Disney, uh, this guy Ken Harsha, who's a, an amazing guy. He's currently doing uh, video games, and he would he would watch movies while he was drawing, and. And sometimes, it like, well, why are you watching that movie? So, I don't know. It just gives me, it puts me in a good mood, and I watch it. <laughs> and sometimes right. he was just, it was just the staging or something about it would just wash over him and uh, and make it go. The the interesting thing I think is about movies and the, and your the dialogue that movies, the conversations that movies have with you, is that you see the poster, and uh, or you see the trailer, and immediately you start writing a movie in your head. And you say like, oh, this is going to be great. That's why I want to see if it paid off the images that I have in my head. And then, you, you know, you go to it. And as you go to it, you're filling in like, oh, man, this kind of thing just uh, happened to me just like this. And, you know, wow, wouldn't it be cooler if this kind of thing happened or, or that? You know, if you're a creative person, your mind is just clicking away when you're watching, especially brilliant stuff, um, even if you're watching terrible stuff. You're saying, oh, this could have been better <laughs> if he'd done this and this and this. Um, yeah. You know, and then you can. The best thing is, you know, if you're a writer, you can just go home and do that. <laughs> you know, yeah. you can you can erase the mistakes of, of, of uh, somebody else's mistakes. But that's that's always the the the, the fun of it. Um, uh, like I said, be a film goer first, a filmmaker second. I'm often amazed. I'll be in even professional meetings with studio executives. And I'll say, hey, what what movies did you go see this weekend? And I'll say, oh, I didn't, I didn't see anything. It's like, well, what what's the last movie you saw? I, like, I don't know, about three four months ago. And I'm like, wow, you're, you know, <laughs> you're making movies and you don't watch movies. 
Yeah. I, I can't I can't breathe if I haven't seen the movies. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I I'll, I'll watch if I can't get to theaters. I'll get. Um, I got what three movies I'm going to watch this weekend. Uh, it's because I missed them, and I was I was kind of upset that I missed them. But um, mm-hmm. they go know, so I'll, fast now that you you miss them, you don't see them in the theater that week or the second week. Yeah. A lot of times they're gone. Yeah, exactly. And they're the tentpole movies are these huge movies, and I'm embarrassed. Yeah. You know, okay, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm watching Spy. I'm watching uh, Jurassic World, and um, and San Andreas. Uh, because I, I I love action movies and I missed all three. Okay. And uh, I've seen Jurassic Everybody World said, about uh, fifty times now because it's like my son's exactly. favorite movie. So, but yeah, I sit there. I, it's funny. I watch it and I, I like pick it apart, like the screenplay and everything. You know, and I try to find some <laughs> oh, what, something I can do while I'm watching it. I'm like, okay, well, let's okay, we're in Act Two and da da da. What's going on? See, I do that all the time, and and it's, sometimes <laughs> it's good, sometimes it's bad. I I try to I I will try to watch without doing that. Um, inevitably, I'm sitting there going, "Oh, okay, that's a nice handshake. That's a nice, you know." <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, the, the bad guy's moving in. That's cool. Uh, yeah. Midpoint. Midpoint seems nice. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, just seeing the scaffolding. I'm sure, like architects, probably go, you know, to the Disney concert hall and say, "Oh, you know, let's go, you know, I don't know what the girders are in the middle of that thing. <laughs> like, how does that thing keep from falling down?" Um, I'm sure you do that. All the time. They do that all the time. Or, or like I say, carpenters or painters are probably you know, painters will always lean in and watch other people's brush strokes. Um, yeah. In fact, that's that's one of the things I, I I like is you learn art by watching other artists in other disciplines. So mm-hmm. um, you know, you go to a museum and you see guys, you know, will be there with an easel repainting the great masters, and uh, I always think, oh wow, that's that's so interesting. And what they're doing is they're trying to copy brushstroke for brushstroke. What did Rembrandt do? And mm. uh, and then they take that and they learn from that. So I say, okay, great. There's no sin in watching movies, getting inspired by them, trying to pick them apart as much as you can. Sometimes I will I will try to write the dialogue from memory just to get it in the flow of it. And uh, and then put your own spin on it. Write your own thing. You know, take it the next step. Mm-hmm. Um, try to figure out like is there a is there a flaw in uh, in you know Citizen Kane, you know can you take a scene from Citizen Kane and blue page it in such a way that it makes it better, or would you just yeah. destroy it if if you got it? Um, I'm often challenging young writers. I say like, well, you have to be able to look at the movies, the top ten movies in theaters right now, and say what would you have done to make it better, because mm-hmm. inevitably that's what you're being asked to do. You know the 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 standard is I get a screenplay uh, like at 6 p.m. On, mm-hmm. on a Monday, and they say, "Hey Rob, you know, bring the screen, bring the script back, uh, and you're meeting with the producer on Monday. Uh, on I'm sorry, tomorrow at 10, and you want to talk about what you what you're going to do to improve the movie. And sometimes <laughs> you're reading them, it's like, well, this is an amazing movie, <laughs> you know, this is this is." This is really great. What do they want to do you know, uh, uh, to it? And you have to figure out. Okay, well, look, I would, I would do this and this and this, and the characters are kind of uh, a little bit limp, and I, you know, the structure could be a lot tighter. I think that the this idea that was de- de- developed late should probably come in earlier, um, and stuff like that. And that's, I mean, that's the, you know, you're painting over a Rembrandt, but you're, you're trying to you want to feel like, yeah, I can make any movie better. Um, and, and when mm-hmm. you, when you have that feeling, then it's like, okay, good, good. I'm, I'm solidly, somebody's going to agree with me and there's a place for me in the industry. <laughs> you know, I, I may get, hopefully I'll get a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I'm not sure that, that it's the, it, is there any is there something that jumps out at you like if you're starting a screenplay what are, what are kind of the common things that you see that I, I mean I don't know if you sit around reading screenplays nowadays oh but, yeah yeah you know what I mean are there are there things that like you know advice you can give to people who are writing screenplays that things that kind of jump out as red flags that okay this maybe is not going to be very well written or whatever Right, exactly, and, and I, I'll tell people I, I throw most scripts away. Uh, most scripts that are not, uh, I'll say it this way: if I'm reading like David Kep or Aaron Sorkin or you know uh, one of those guys, I'll read the script from top to bottom. You know, Quentin Tarantino. Mm-hmm. You know, when when Hateful Eight came out, 
I couldn't wait to read it. I knew it was like the wrong thing to do, but I just, I, <laughs> I, ate, I, I ate that thing up. It's just his, his writing is just poetry and it's a sin that I'm sorry to have committed. I'll, I'll atone for it at some point, but it was just a brilliant piece of writing. Uh, so I'll read that top to bottom. Uh, usually if a friend gives me a script, um, and I have to read it, I will. But if, if I don't have to read it, I'll always tell them I'm probably only going to read the first five pages. If you're lucky, I'll read eight or 12, but I'm going to, I'm probably going to throw it away at some point and I'll tell you why. And it's usually because there's, uh, uh, people think that a 120 page screenplay, you can just write pages, you know, Oh, I'll just write until I get up to 120. Like it's a book. Um, but, uh, but every page on a screenplay, there is a re- requirement for it. On the first page, you have to do a lot of things. You know, the first three mm-hmm. pages, you, you know, there's a, there's a ton of stuff you need to do as far as setting up the world and the character and making me, engaging me into that character uh, and, um, you know, showing me what's great about the character, what's flawed about the character, it, starting to introduce the idea of an inciting incident, you know, drawing me into the story a little bit, and then boom, you know, whatever, landing me with an inciting incident that's going to pull me through the rest of the movie. If, if, if in those first 12 pages I don't have that, then I'm just tossing it because I know the guy doesn't know what he's doing. It's like, you know, when you've seen somebody who, who, who can't throw very well, you know, if you see a, a, a wobbly <laughs> football, you know, you know there's a big problem there. If you see the guy, you know, who doesn't plant his feet and stuff, you know, if you've played enough football, you know from yeah. the time that the guy backs up and pulls his hand back, you know the guy doesn't know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Same thing is true of, of a screenplay. It's like, oh, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be torture. And so I'll, I'll draw a red line in it and I'll say, I would have stopped reading here because your, the wheels were way off the wagon. And then I'll, and then I'll, uh, and then I'll go. But yeah, no, it's, it's a, uh, it's tough. I mean, I, you know, cause I, I want to see, uh, you know, at least like an, a, a, a good setup of a great character that I can, that I can deal with. Um, a, uh, an inciting incident that means something, a midpoint that is, that is dynamic and it shifts in storytelling and the dynamics of the story an all is lost that is meaningful that, that where, where the all that is driven for during the entire movie is the thing that is lost and now oh no what's going to happen and then you know and, and then a, a, a great bring me home you know uh, do that the other thing that I mm-hmm. think that's missing is, is meaning like a lot of times people will just sit down and write and I really don't have any idea like what, what, you know, what is this about <laughs> what do you want me to, what do you want the takeaway to be yeah. How do you want this to move me? How are you trying to change my mind about something? What are you trying to show me? And there's nothing. It's just, well, I just wanted to write a detective movie, see if I could do it. Like, well, yeah, that that you've done, but I'm, it's, it's, <laughs> it's you know, it's confection. It's just sugar can, you know, sugar cake. Um, right. You know, it, you look at something like uh, Hamlet, and you know, the first line of Hamlet. I always like to think every every writer should know it. No, no writer does, but it's the first letter. Uh, <laughs> you know. Is uh, is Halt who goes there, and it's great. It's um, you know, uh, you know, oh, you come most quickly upon your hour, and you know, whatever. And and they they're they're talking, uh, and and it's very quickly the conversation is, what's going on? Why is this guy so edgy? And oh, well, has the ghost appeared yet? The ghost, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like oh yeah, and then the ghost appears like six pages in, and it says to Hamlet, yeah, you got to kill your stepdad. <laughs> and, you know, and and then it's 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 ripping and roaring, right? So the so uh, and that's and that's Shakespeare, zillions of years mm-hmm. ago, and yeah. he knew that the that you have to pull the readers, you have to drag the readers' eyes through the story. You have to drag the the audience member who is preoccupied with popcorn and 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 is their seat comfortable and you know whatever is their slushy the right flavor. Uh, you have to yank them into the story. And um, uh, and go as you know, ask meaningful questions right away, so that the you know so so that you've got the person's attention, and then give it weight and meaning, and have the story have the story last with them afterwards. And that I just I would say of a hundred scripts I've a uh, 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 hundred scripts I've read in the last couple of years, um, maybe one or two have have meaning beyond beyond the words on the paper. Um, mm-hmm. 
for me, I, I, I sometimes will blame that on the uh, on the software that everybody will start writing the screenplay before they know what the screenplay is about. Uh, yeah. They'll try to figure it out afterwards, and a lot of people are like, "Hey, man, it's just jazz, dude. I just want to figure it out." Like you're you're roaching my buzz <laughs> with your with your whole story and theme stuff. And I'm like, "Okay, fine, do it. You know, do it to get through it." But I'm not going to read it. You know, I'm not going to read it until you say, <laughs> "You have to read this because it is important that you know this movie." This movie has weight and gravity. It makes me cry every time I read it. Um, you know, that's the screenplay you want to read. That that one, even if it's even if it's poorly executed, is a better read than the perfectly mm-hmm. you know scaled uh, you know piece of crap confection mm-hmm. you know whatever <laughs> you know um, right. a great you know a terrible steak is better than uh, a, a fantastic piece of bread. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> a good analogy um so let, let me ask you something you know when do you find now i i mean one of the biggest mistakes that i made i i recently you know probably four years ago after kind of giving up for a while i started going back to writing again and started making all the mistakes that i made back when i was in my 20s one one of the big ones was you know talking to people who would tell me hey just write you know just every day write but my my interpretation of that was oh well i should start writing my screenplay. And I immediately yeah, right. realized that I, I wrote a first draft that was terrible, you know, yeah. and it was like, I didn't know who my characters were. I would go off on a tangent. I would go here and there. And now what I, what I do, and, and, you know, I've talked to a number of screenwriters that I, I really respect and they, they've kind of agreed with me is, you know, I'll go, I'll spend a lot more time now going, you know, sitting down at a Starbucks, getting into a place where I can kind of get into my groove and just writing note after note after note and like throwing out, you know, pages of stuff that I write and not really even thinking about writing the screenplay until everything has been completely thought out and, and you know, worked out in my head. And then once I sit down to write, which for me is kind of tor- – I mean, I hate sitting down to write. But, um, <laughs> I think you know what I mean? Can. It's like <laughs> – Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was funny. I was talking to no, but that's, uh, Alex. That is uh, what you're saying is is exactly. I mean, if, if, if okay. whatever anybody gets out of this podcast, like that, at its core, circle that, <laughs> highlight it in yellow, you know, whatever, put exclamation marks uh, by it. That that is the core of it. That, that that so many people think writing is writing is sitting down, like ah, oh, fade in interior, you know, uh, house day, uh, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> And 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 going and and like and I my my thing is even with story format like I don't care if it fades in or or, or if it doesn't I don't care if it's interior or exterior I don't care where it is happening whatever I just care about what are these two people talking about and um you know what's in their heart and and all of that and so it's the cards it's just it's just what am I saying I've got three pages to hold you know my three first pages that anybody's going to read what do I have to say that's going to hold their attention. You know, you look at the Pixar stuff, it's all like dynamic openings, you know, the, the, the NASCAR, you know, and here's a yeah. here's the fastest guy in the world. He's cocky and arrogant. Everybody loves him, but his pit crew quits on him. Awesome. You know, uh, in, in the Incredibles, you know, oh, man, you know, whatever. After the, 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 the first thing with the interviews, the, uh, you know, Bob Parr saves eight people, you know, eight sets of people, and mm-hmm. is late to his own wedding. Awesome. Okay, great. I know what's great about him. I know what's terrible about him. You know, and that's all like just – Brad Bird sitting down with, you know, with a pen on a pad and just saying, okay, I'm going to throw away 20 openings, you know, <laughs> until I can find one that's just purely brilliant. And and you don't write that just longhand. You know, you say, okay, well, he's going to save a cat and a tree, and then he's going to save the thing. And Bon Voyage is a character and Syndrome is a character. Okay, great. How can I mix that up? And then how can I have the last thing he does be something that he can be – convicted for and that will end you know being superheroes forever great it should be a train crash everybody hurts them everybody hurts their necks nobody dies blah 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 you know whatever and then he's got the whole thing kind of worked out perfectly then and only then does he sit down and write it and then when you as you're writing it you know you're not going to throw stuff away you know mm-hmm. you know what the you know what the parameters are of doing it and it makes the writing so much easier you're not pulling it out of a you know, you're, you're not like, oh, I'm you know, climbing a climbing a mountain to get these these things out. You're writing with joy and enthusiasm because you know what the payoff is, and you know, uh, like, oh, great, I've got, 
I'm showing off how great this character is. You're writing with a smile. You know, I li- I, I, I laugh all the time when I'm writing um, because the, surpri- <laughs> <laughs> the surprises are like, oh, good, this little turn of dialogue. And I know it's not going to waste because I know the attitude of the character even before I sat down to write it. Um, you know, I, and I've said yeah. to myself, I've made a bet with myself. I bet I can come up with some really awesome jokes between these two characters uh, in this situation. And right. if I point it in the right direction, if I, you know, I, I have a page and a half, two pages to do it, I know that this is my last line. You know, when I was working with Sorkin, all he would do was he would write down the last line of the last line of dialogue for the scene on a card, and that would be that would be the card for that scene. Mm-hmm. And then the conversation would be like, okay, great, I, I will. I know the characters, I know the thrust of it, I will find my way to it, but I know that I'm going to land it. If I stick to landing, that's the last line of the scene. So that's the game. That's the fun of it. You know. Um, right. And when you're writing like that, and you're writing with that enthusiasm and that and that and, and that uh, sure-footedness, then you're reading like that. You know, <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not. Uh, uh, you know, how many times you've read scripts and you just say, "Where is this going? You know, this is yep. this is going nowhere." He's just, he already said this. He said this three pages ago. I don't need to have this argument again. Oh, well, geez, where am I now? You know, oh, it's a forty-page first act. <laughs> you know, and yeah. and you're just you're just saying, you know. You know what are you doing? Yeah, it's like it's like you know you watch somebody. Um, I always use sports analogies, but you know it's like three, <laughs> two, one, one, two, three, you know, whatever. No, the buzzer <laughs> goes off and the game is over. You know, the athlete knows he, where he's got to go. He's got right. he's got three seconds to get you know cross court. Um, he's he's two points behind, so he's got to nail the three. You know, so he knows where he's got to pull up. Hopefully, he's done it a bunch of times and you know and he's going to sink it i'll say one other thing because it's when i was talking about like uh, learning from other disciplines i've been kind of watching the way people learn how to play music uh a lot recently just just as a way to kind of shorthand conversations with writers about like how to learn how how to write and and when you're starting to write like uh, trying to learn piano you don't sit down and learn like you know Mozart's concerto. You know, <laughs> you know the first time you sit down at the piano, you learn you know either chopsticks or you learn Mary Had a Little Lamb. You know, you learn the easiest thing in the world. So when people ask me like, okay, well, what what is missing now with 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 screenwriting teaching, and what what is what are we missing in general? Why are screen why are so many new screenwriters coming out and they they just can't write? I say, well, look, do what you do if you were learning if you were learning piano. Tell me the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and make it compelling. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first question I'll ask is, okay, great. Let's, you know, it's a very short story. You can tell it in two minutes. But first question: Who's the main character in Goldilocks and, and Three Bears? And people say, oh, it's Goldilocks. I say, no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> You're rewriting Goldilocks and Three Bears. Goldilocks and Three Bears is a crime story, and then it's a <laughs> detective story. <laughs> right? You know, Goldilocks comes in and she basically breaks into a house, commits three crimes, and then the baby bear, main character, you know, figures out the crime. <laughs> <laughs> you right. know, one to the other to the oh my god, there's somebody in my bed, and then you know, and then off you go. And so that's the character with the drive. The 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 first part with Goldilocks is just a is just a prologue. Good, okay, fine. So motivate the the, the bear. You know, the bear really, you know, has had a long walk, is really hungry and just wants to sit, play Nintendo and take a nap. You know, that's the drive right. of the character. So so if you can get through that that, that story or, or even the three pigs, you know, the, I believe the brick pig is the main pig and the, uh, is, is the main character, not the wolf and not the uh, not either of the other two pigs. So but t- <laughs> find, a, find a point of view or if you want to tell it from the wolf's point of view, tell it from the wolf's point of view. Why does he want to blow down these houses? Um, you know, those fundamental questions that you ask yourself as you're telling these three-minute stories are the same exact things that you'll try to tackle if you're doing a 110, 120-page screenplay. Um, and you'll get to cut your teeth on them. You know, you'll get to make your mistakes on, on a three-minute pitch as opposed to waiting three months and writing, you know, writing a whole story. You know, yeah. an unmotivated baby bear is the same, you know, is the same sin you're going to commit <laughs> in your in your in your whole colossal thing, you know, the the 
the uh, you know without a point of view, without a like, why are you telling the story of this of this crime and this uh, this detective thing? Um, uh, what tone are you using as you're telling it? Is it are you comedic? Is it a horror horror movie? <laughs> you know, it's kind of a horror movie to me. <laughs> you know, this lady is broken as she's sleeping in my bed. Oh no, you know, whatever. It's it's a single yeah, white female. It definitely female. could have gone bad fast. You know. Exactly. And, you know, is it, what does the bear do? You know, does the bear right. eat her? Does, does she, you know, what does she do when she's caught? Do they, can, you know, can they call a cop? You know, that, that all that kind of stuff. All that story yeah. fun is the, is the, you know, have it on a small level. Play chopsticks. Learn how to play chopsticks. When chopsticks sounds good, then move on to a bigger story. And, right. um, you know, and tell that. Tell that really well. And then move on. You know, start bringing your own, and each time you're going to bring your own elements in. But uh, but ultimately, you'll be able to say, okay, this is a story of, you know, the the Prince of Asgard, who, you know, whatever, whose father, you know, uh, who's, who's sought the love of his father for, for an eternity and, you know, and has never thought himself worthy of the kingdom of Asgard. And now he is, you know, uh, 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 now he has this this great challenge in front of him, and blah 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 blah. And again, you know, you're you're using the same the same skills that you you know you've cut your teeth on the other stories. Now you're ready to tell that story because you've found a point of view. There's a great takeaway. You probably by then have have gotten some sense of you know what's boring, what works, and what doesn't work. Um, you know uh, where you what what with you resonates. What kind of great things can you come up with? Uh, uh, that 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 work for the story, you know, and then you're, I don't know. <laughs> I was thinking like you you'd be so much better off a year into mm-hmm. it than than by slogging away and just writing terrible screenplays one after the other. Are you kind of constantly going through and and looking at your scene and saying, okay, do we, you know, can we cut this or what are we establishing? What's the beginning, middle, and ending of this scene? What what is this character trying to get? Or, or whatever, do you kind of go through and analyze like that? Always. Yeah, the first time uh, my – in fact, I, I don't even write my first draft on on the computer. I, I, I think it's like third or fourth draft goes on the computer. The first couple of drafts are actually on uh, just uh, – on iPhone. Lucid. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes I'll just dictate it off, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> okay, cop pulling me over. Or yes, I am dictating my screenplay into my phone as I go. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, you know that, that that you just want to get the ideas down. So so sometimes yeah. you know my first draft through, and I'll I'll, I'll I'll go into it thinking, oh, this is going to be gold, and I'm just going to write it once and publish it. Um, but I'll write it down, and then I will uh, I'll read it through. I'll write it again longhand, and then um, when I feel like it's kind of ready, I'll type it, and then I'll type it immediately, print it. And I actually wish there was some way that I could squeeze all the words over to the right, uh, over to the left side, because I'm gonna basically rewrite the entire scene, top to mm-hmm. bottom. You know, once I once I've seen it and I say, ah, this is good, not great, um, yeah. then I rewrite it again. And, I'm, and and all the while through, I'm asking myself, okay, is this character driven? Are the obstacles clear? Uh, is it essentially like the biggest question is, is it clear what this scene's about? You know, mm-hmm. the scene should not be about two or three things. It should be about one thing. I want to get one idea, introduce it, sell the audience on this idea, and the scene move out. So yeah, so if I have too long a discussion about baseball at the beginning of the scene, that's all going to go. Um, if I uh, if I've over made my point, I get out. Mm-hmm. So I'll I'll start doing that. But I'm super hard on on those scenes. Usually in the afternoon, in the morning, I'm more creative. So I'll just kind right. of write. I'll just sit and uh, uh, Robert Rodriguez gave me this tip, and you know, whatever he was talking um, uh, on a, another podcast, and gave this tip, and I thought, oh, that's brilliant. He says the worst thing about <laughs> the worst thing about waking up is the waking up. He's kind of getting out of bed, making breakfast, and all that stuff. So he just keeps a pad by his bed, and when he wakes up, he just turns on the light and starts working. Mm-hmm. And then after you know, an hour or so, then he puts it away makes his coffee and gets, you know, gets into his daily routine. And I thought, okay, that's awesome. So, <laughs> so that's what <laughs> I, I do now. I just kind of, I'll get up, I'll just kind of turn on the nightlight and, and, uh, and just start writing. And, you know, the world is quiet. 
if I've asked myself great questions before I went to sleep, I probably solved them during the night. So I'm really ready to go. Uh, well, you know, it sounds my... very, very similar to a book. I'm not sure if it's called The Creative Mind or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it talks about how the, the the state of mind that you're in when you are half awake is that you're way, way into your right side of your brain. Yeah. So uh, the creative ideas just are flowing. So, yeah, if you, especially like if you wake up in the middle of the night – or you, you know, when you wake up early in the morning and all that before before your brain starts focusing on anything, you know, exactly. that's that's probably the most creative time. Right. Exactly. What was it? Uh, Aaron Sorkin. He says he, he takes ten showers a day. I'm pretty sure it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a little weird, but it's 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 the same thing uh, that, that right. you're you're kind of getting into that um, almost meditative state. Um, yeah. You know, and and I find personally the longer I'm awake, like midday to the afternoon, the critic wakes up and he just starts telling me how terrible, you know, <laughs> what a terrible yeah. writer I am and how I should just, you know, pack it up and go back to Detroit and, you know, that, that medicine probably wasn't that bad of an idea <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and all that. And, uh, and so that guy's, you know, live and kicking the, the longer I'm awake. And that's why I, uh, Usually in the afternoon, because that guy's valuable too. You know, he keeps he holds me to a higher standard. He's he's easily bored, so uh, you know he will. Uh, he's the the you know the, the cross out. You know, as I'm crossing out huge pages of dialogue, he's that guy. Um, but I need that guy. I, I just mm-hmm. don't want him in the morning when I'm composing. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading this thing because I do think that there, there's the even with actors, right? You know, you get into a slightly meditative state. You want to get nice and relaxed and let the creative process go. You know, be able to access your emotions, uh, not be so guarded. Um, you know, make yourself laugh, make yourself cry. Uh, uh, is it, uh, uh, John August says he will, he will go and look in the mirror and, uh, and wait until, you know, think of things that make him, that will make him cry. And then he, once he starts crying, then he goes and starts writing, because then mm-hmm. he's in he's in state. You know, he's he's mm-hmm. in a he's in a very emotional you know um, uh, uh, yeah, mood, and he finds that the writing he does in that is better is in that mood is you know those are the scenes when when you're going to need to cry. Obviously, you don't do it <laughs> through the entire movie. You know, you just do it <laughs> through those key scenes where you want people to cry. Um, uh, I will play, you know, Danny Elfman or some like really kind of rousing music for action scenes, um, mm-hmm. and I'll and a lot of times I'll I'll just make sure I'm in a really great mood if I'm writing comedy. Uh, I, I rarely will, and this is another f- fun thing for me. I rarely write movies in sequence. Um, I always mm. uh, I, I eat my dessert first, so. Uh, if once I have my movie up on the wall or, you know, on the door and, the door. Uh, uh, and I've, maybe I've, I've outlined it or maybe I've kind of, there are a couple of scenes that I've kind of, you know, uh, where I have some general ideas where I'm going to go. I'll pick the one that I, that I really, really want to write. Usually the third act, um, the, the third act, what I call the super freak, um, where you, <laughs> where you're going to cry, you know, where, where Luke Skywalker turns off the, uh, turns off the tracking machine and, and, and uses the force and blows up the Death Star, right? That's mm-hmm, the first scene. That's going to be the all, most awesome scene anyway. And I know I'm going <laughs> to rewrite it a bunch of times, but it's, it's going to be the most fun to write. And, uh, so yeah, so I'll just sit down and I'll write that one and then I'll, you know, print it up, put it in a book, put it in my little, little notebook with, uh, you know, with my, my little subdividers and uh and then I'll go back and I'll write the second most exciting scene and the third and the fourth and the fifth so by the time I'm uh I'm down to the last scene I've got the energy of all the other scenes that I've written and the hard scene usually the first scene the hard, the scene that I hate writing the most uh that'll have all of that energy in it and I'll be so much uh, more comfortable with my characters I'll know their voices I know what makes them tick what's you know what what's cool and playable about them and then I can just make a meal of those hard scenes. Mm-hmm. But I do that. Do you typically deal. find your character in scenes that are like, you know, if you're struggling to find who a character is, maybe there's a scene that takes place in the second act where it's like, oh, well, that's that's who he is, you know, and then you yeah. can kind of put that back into the first act, and now you're like, I know he's got to get to this point. 
Exactly. And that's why, you know, like even the reading of a screenplay, right? The, the, mm. if that scene can't be buried. The scene where I know where that character is, that scene's yeah. got to be his introduction or her introduction. That, um, that the first scene, and uh, it's funny, right, right before uh, we started talking, I was worried, I'm breaking a new story for another screenplay. I, I, I like to write specs. So uh-huh. um, I, I just finished one, so that's off kind of in the hands of an actor right now. And uh, in my spare time as I'm waiting, as I'm just kind of sweating it out, I, I started uh, <laughs> breaking an, another story. And this was a story I, I, I just came up with at a party. I was talking to some friends and I said, well, why isn't there a movie like this? You know, where these characters come together for this reason, and you get this and this and whatever. And I was like, "Oh, that sounds like a great movie." <laughs> and I said, "Okay, good. Don't don't say anything else because you're gonna, uh, you know, <laughs> you're gonna take all the fun of actually having written it <laughs> away from me because he was telling me what's great about my idea." So I said, "Okay, right. great." I, I ran home and I just started, you know, putting it up on cards, and and saying, "Okay, I think I have enough fun scenes to do this. I think it there are enough twists and turns, and it's got emotional impact." And, it's about, you know, uh, some things that I'm dealing, you know, my, my, my son just went off to college, so I'm dealing with all that stuff. And, uh, and so this is a perfect movie for me right now. I'm writing my own favorite movie, right? Like, you know, that, that if, mm-hmm. if this movie was, was in theaters, I would be the first in line to see it. And so that's my <laughs> first step. Great. Okay, right. good. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make me cry. It's going to make me think about, you know, <laughs> about families and how important they are and father and son relationships and, and all that. That's the emotional template. And then it's got fun sci-fi uh, stuff with it and a bunch of really great action and oh great that'll be good. Um, then I start playing around with it. Okay, good. Well, who's the who's the antagonist? Who's the protagonist? Antagonists run, you know, uh, usually run the show, uh, run the store with uh, uh, action movies. So great, I'll start into that. Um, and you know, like we were just talking about, like when I introduce these characters, I want to introduce them doing something dynamic and that reveals their character. I don't want I don't want you to just say oh these are some pages about this. It should be oh wow this is really cool to watch. This character is going to be compelling and fun to to to, uh, to watch go through this movie. And if I'm an actor, boy do I want to play this character. So I'm so now I'm challenging myself the the other step, which is what does an actor you know what does an actor want to read? What does a great actor want to read when mm-hmm. they when they pick up a screenplay? You know first they want to appear on the first page or two, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. important because uh, <laughs> they're not going to read beyond that. They, they're just, they have to appear on, on page one. And the first thing they read has to be, oh, that's awesome. I like this guy. And, uh, you know, he's got an edge. He's got something fun. <laughs> and he's, right. he's doing something in a, in a really cool way. And then it's got to keep pulling him through. So I'm, so I'm, uh, so that was most of the morning uh, was, was just, okay, I got, two characters, I want to introduce them. I want to have them do cool things. They have to do different cool things. They have to, uh, I'm getting, I want them to meet cute. You know, that's always a fun thing. Uh-huh. I know they're going to have yeah. to meet. So what's going to be their cute meet? Um, and I figured, okay, great. Precinct station. You know, they're both, they're both bad <laughs> kids. And, uh, and they've both been busted for doing, you know, uh, whatever it is they've been, they've been doing. And so, oh, that'll be fun. And what if they meet a third guy while they're there? And blah 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 blah. And so, so that was that was me plotting this thing. So I I, I think I'm on sure footing with with where I'm introducing these characters. They all have dynamics, and they all you know they all feel like characters great actors would want to play. At the very least, the executive reading it will get what I'm what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, <laughs> And so I think I'm I'm okay there. It may go through you know 50, 60 changes by by the time I'm done, but I think I'm on sure footing. Now I'm going to go on to the second section, and I just want to know at that point what are the um, uh, uh, you know how can I how can I line up a really fun story for these for these three? And I know, like I said, I've I've, I've done my homework. I know the inciting incident. I know the uh, midpoint. I know the end of Act Two. Uh, I know my super freak. Um, so, and that's all, you I'm know, take that's that. all I, I know right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, super freak is from, is from a uh, uh, little miss sunshine, right? Where they're, we're all through the movie. They've been saying like, Hey, you know, we're not going to go if you're not going to win. Winning is the most important thing in the, in the world in this thing, you know, and, this, and in this family, you know, if you're not a winner, you know, you're nothing. And she says, Oh, daddy, I'm going to win. 
when they get up on stage, you know, she gets up on stage and it's this routine that a grand, <laughs> grandfather is choreographer, <laughs> uh, choreographed for, and she's dancing yeah. the super freak and doing a strip show. And in that, and all, all the audience is yelling at him and all that stuff. And at that moment, the dad steps up, jumps up on stage and starts dancing. And yeah. the whole family dances. And it's, and that's what every movie is striving to do, right? That there's the thing that you're driving through all the way through, an avatar or whatever, the thing that you want the most. And then in that moment, you say, you know what? Not so important. The other thing, the, the underdog value is, is way more important. And that's what mm-hmm. the movie's about. So that's in the DNA of every scene in the movie. That's why I say, like, I'll throw it away in the first six pages because I know it's not there. You know, if it's not organic to the pages, then it's just not going to be, you know, no matter how many pages I read, if I read all the way to the end, it's not going to be there because it's not there in the first page. You know, um, you know, you, so, you but know what you're what saying I, is the thing that the thing that they think they want is not what they actually need or what they actually exactly. want. Exactly. Okay. So I should be rooting for them. When I see Lightning McQueen, you know, uh, 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 get in a three-way tie at the end of the movie and I see a sick crew quit, you know, you know, the right movies to talk to me about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you <know>, good. They're good. <laughs> but I know what, well, I know what I want that movie to be, you know, yeah. because, uh, you know, again, the math of storytelling, uh, and this is just me. I, I, I've just found it that the inciting incident and the super freak are the exact mirror opposites of each other. So mm. in the, um, so in the, uh, uh, I'll keep talking Incredibles too. That that or, or no, better yet, um, uh, Finding Nemo. Right? In Finding right. Nemo, the inciting incident is that he yells at his kid for being unsafe, and the kid, in defiance, goes and touches the boat, and then that you know gets caught and takes him off you know, forever. Mm-hmm. The super freak of that of that is his son is saying, "I can save these fish." The father knows it's dangerous, and the father makes the opposite choice. The father says, "You know what? I trust you." I yep. love you and I trust you. Go do it. You know, it's a more, much more dangerous thing, you know, than, than touching a boat, you know, is, is risking your life to do the thing. And, uh, you know, and of course the sun winds up, it seems like he's hurt. He's on the bottom of the ocean floor and, um, and, you know, the father feels like crap, but he's, he knows that he's done the right thing by his son. He's let his son grow. And then the, his, the father and son have this really fantastic moment where where they bond. Mm-hmm. And he says, "Hey, Sammy Plankton doesn't know anything, and whatever I've seen all this stuff, right?" Now, if you look at you look at a movie like that, and you think, "Oh, okay, well that's just a Pixar movie." But if you look at Flight, Flight has the exact same ending. You know, in the critical moment, does he tell the truth or does he lie? He chooses mm-hmm. to tell the truth, right? He's lied to get himself into it in the inciting incident. He tells the truth uh, to the to to essentially the same panel. At the at, in the super freak, and in so doing, his son comes back, and his son talks to him in prison, and and it's a and there's not a dry eye in the house. So at every level, everybody's telling the same. You know, all great storytellers are using very similar templates to tell their stories. Um, you know, the same as all all great quarterbacks drop back in the same way and deliver a ball in the same way. Um, and so, and and so, for us as storytellers, it's it's a question of okay, what is that? What are the, what what is the science of you know what is the sweet science of storytelling? You know, and mm-hmm. uh, and what are people looking at when they read my stuff? And and what is that specifically? What is that giving us when we, you know, when we when we sit down to uh, to to read or write a great screenplay? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. You know, it's it's funny because I, I just recently wrote an article about how people who have kids can can be screenwriters even though they're they're busy all the time. And one of the biggest you know tips I gave or whatever was, you know, every time you're watching a Pixar movie, you're watching some of the best screenplay structure that's been created. You know, yeah. it's like the the storytelling is so amazing on Finding Nemo, The Incredible. I mean, it, basically any Pixar movie. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just I would sit there and I'd, I'd like draw a line down the middle of a sheet of paper and just beat for beat. Like I, I did this a month ago with Finding Nemo mm-hmm. and it helped me so much to learn structure, just writing out all the beats of Finding Nemo and what happens and, and whatever. And then yeah. you can go back and kind of use that structure, you know, for your own story or just kind of internalize yeah. it, I guess. Well, it just came up. Uh, Finding Nemo just came up in a, a studio uh, meeting I, I, I had uh, um 
just a couple of days ago. And it was about, um, and it's basically, it's a fantastic road picture. <laughs> you know, it's, uh-huh. it's a guy who, a, a guy who holds onto the past and a person who can't remember 10 seconds ago. And so there's a unity of opposites. Those two characters are, are, are really well paired. And then every single challenge they have is a challenge of trust for Marlin. You know, that, that it's, yeah, sure, it's fun and games, but it's, you know, do you go through the trench or over the trench? You know, she mm-hmm. says through is the better way because she knows something. She doesn't know why she knows it. She doesn't know the fish has told her. But she says through the trench is, is safer. He doesn't trust her. They go over the trench. Bad things happen. You know, uh, on down the line, just bad, bad. You know, he doesn't trust her for, for any reason. And then finally, they get to the – they're on the whale's tongue. And she says, let go. Um, you know, it's a great scene. And it's a scene that would be great in any movie. She says, let mm-hmm. go. The, 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 the whale is telling me that we, you know, that we should let go of, of, of the tongue and that everything will be okay. And he says, you don't know these things, Nemo. You, you, know, you always think you do, but you don't. And, yeah. um, and she says, let go. Just let go. And in that moment, you know, and that's midpoint, right? At that moment, he lets go of the tongue. They go back to the back of the throat and everything works out. Now they're in, you know, now they're in Sydney. And that those moments, that's story gold. You know, that, that's, that's Andrew Stanton, who is one of the greatest storytellers that ever lived. You know, a guy who has studied everything and who is yeah. the architect of all of that stuff at, uh, at, at Pixar. Um, uh, uh, Did you ever read the book, Creative Inc.? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I believe I'm in creativity. Inc. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to ask because I was like, you know, it sounds like you'd probably be in. That. <laughs> yeah. Because there was this, there was this revolution at, uh, at Disney where, uh, um, you know, some of the new guys, you know, uh-huh. where, um, cause John had come around, uh, John was there for Bolt, but only for half of Bolt. So Bolt was kind of developed outside of him and then he took it and did what he could with it in the time he had left. And it's a great movie. And then The Princess and the Frog was the first one he did from from you know stem to stern. And so um, so and, and at a certain point I heard that that, that they that uh, Princess and the Frog was almost released as a Pixar film because they had okay. so much involvement in it. We were up there every three months at, at, at in Emeryville at, at, at Pixar. And uh, and John was there two three times a week, like all the time. It was it was great. Just working with him, he would get in the sandbox and 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 and, and <laughs> jump in and suggest stuff. It was, it was fantastic. So um, yeah, so so uh, you know we we I was I was so in the reverie. I, wait, give me the question again because I, I was like, that eh, was awesome. Well, like I'm like talking about playing in the sandbox. <laughs> uh, give me the question again. Well, I mean, I just I just love the um, you know the concept of how movies came together and how there was kind of the the creative committee there that would look at you know look at a story um, piece by piece you know or or you know put it up on a wall and people would kind of like talk about the the weaknesses and and that yeah. that would be kind of the way of working out a story versus somebody just sitting by themselves exactly and it's and it's a little bit it, it's funny because it's brutal you know that's the part nobody <laughs> tells you about is that it is it is completely honest and everybody is uh the the emphasis is you, you know john when he won um the he won the student academy award like i think uh, twice or three times and when they asked him, you know, what he was doing, how, you know, was he trying to win awards or, or what, or he, had, he seemed to have, like, rigged the game. He said, no, I, I'm, I make films, I try to make films as, as well as I can. I'm just trying to make good movies. And it just happens to be that people give awards to movies that are good, you know. <laughs> and and right. when they had asked him about his, his, what is it, 14 Academy Award streak, um, mm-hmm. he said, He's the, essentially the same thing. Look, I just want to make good movies. You know, they're, yeah. they're not movies for kids. That's the thing everybody misses. They're not movies for right. kids. They're movies for, for, for John and, uh, you know, and, and, and Andrew and, and those guys. And, um, you know, they're, they're really just entertaining themselves. They happen to be great, great filmmakers and, uh, and they're fantastic writers. And, they are looking at the films that are, they're looking at great independent films. They're looking at, you know, they're, they're vociferous. They're, there's always a screening there. And, um, and they're, they're trying to move the, you know, move the form to the next level. 
uh, you know, they, they, uh, with what they have, you know, they have shiny colors and you know computer graphics and all that stuff. But really, they're yeah. just trying to make they're just trying to make the best movies you know humanly possible. Um, and and so yeah, you can learn you can learn a ton from every one of those movies. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite things about like the Blu-rays is that they show all the behind the scenes, and I mean, they put a lot of you know energy into create like going around the I can't remember which which one it was but they were just you know going around the whole studio and talking about what everybody was doing and everything and and as an outsider it's just amazing to get that kind of you know insight oh yeah it seems like the best place in the world to work basically yeah right well well yeah exactly I mean you know and the the Disney thing too where where um it is Basically, you have a room, and and you always want that. It was, uh, you know, Fresh Prince was a little bit like that. Um, uh, Studio 60 with Aaron Sorkin, a lot like that, where people are dedicated to telling great stories. And you start off in the day, and it was not uncommon for people to say, hey, I had a dream about your movie. I want to talk to you about it. And, you know, and, and just people are that committed where they say, okay, here's here's what you can do. And they just start going, right. and yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, I would leave my door open just for that because everybody was coming in with new ideas, and there was always this excitement. And you have an idea, and everybody's the, the notion is yeah, plus it, you know, uh, make this. How can we make this a little bit better? You know, uh, better by you know a, a deviation of one. And, and um, yeah, so so, uh, uh, but that's the environment that you want is everybody is down, everybody is just having a blast everybody knows that the thing you will ultimately do is really special and they know like any great team they know that what you're going to do is uh it, you know that it, once they pass you the ball you're going to do something even even more special with it and the thing that they see next week or whatever is going to be even better you know that's mm-hmm. everybody that's that's a great 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 environment um they're uh, i i uh, sometimes I'll think like, ah, oh, they're few and far between. But I think everybody is striving to do that. Sometimes mm-hmm. there is, they're just not the horses. So the advantage you get with a Pixar environment or you know, like a Disney, is that the best people are going to show up at your door, and they're going to work, want to work all night, <laughs> you know. Right. And and so it is a self, um, it's a self fulfilling prophecy that great things are going to happen. You know, right. uh, there's a great story that, that Ed Cap. Paul talks about in in his book, um, and uh, and it's that he says he would ask a, a room full of people, a room room full of like managers, if you had a great idea or the great team, which you know which would you rather have? You know, okay, great, mm-hmm. you have a great idea and you have whatever team, you have a great team and a so so an idea, and he said they would always go fifty fifty. Well, great idea, great team. He says nope, without question. If you have a great idea and a terrible team or a mediocre team, the, the mediocre team will destroy the great idea. If you have a great <laughs> a great team and mediocre idea, the great team will instantly discover that you have a mediocre idea. They'll either throw it out or they'll improve it in such a way that it will be great. So 100 times out of 100, the great team will make a great product. The mediocre team with a great idea, no matter how many great ideas you feed into that mediocre team, they're going to blow it. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so that's always the thing, like trust, trust the process, trust the talent, get great people, find a way to, you know, lure them there, you know, Apple computers, same way, Google, you know, you get guys who don't mind staying up all night to make it great. And, uh, and then you just kick back, you give them whatever you need, whatever they need to keep going. And, and it's fantastic. Yeah, so here's a story I was going to tell about <laughs> about the, the <laughs> Burbank Revolution, right? So so John gets in there, and there's a bunch of old school guys at at, at Disney. I'm, I'm telling tales out of school a little bit, but there's there's a bunch <laughs> of the guys who who've been at Disney forever, and um and their thing is, look, it's Disney, it's going to be Disney, you know, no matter what you do. But John was bringing this whole new school thing, and John had actually come from you know Disney originally before he went up to Emeryville and then came back. Mm-hmm. So, um, so he knew what he was talking about, but, but, yeah, and he was saying like, look, here's the way, you know, you, you spend a lot of time on the story, you bring in some screenwriters, you have, you know, these great discussions, you throw away two thirds of the movie, every screening, every three months, you do six screenings. And then ultimately what you wind up with is the 
best possible story possible, you know, in, in the world, and then you go nuts on the animation just to make it as great as you as you possibly can. But story is king, and then the animation comes second. And people are like, "What? What are you talking about? You know, this is that's heretic. <laughs> you know, burn him. You know, <laughs> you know." And, and and uh and so for me i was like look i completely you know being from tv i'm like yes that is awesome that's exactly what we should be doing and i would uh uh my door was always open anytime there was new writers i would go to their office introduce myself and i would just sit down and say hey what are you working on uh you know what kind of problems are you having i'm i i'm using you as my break you know, and uh, I'm going to try to be as collaborative as possible. I'm just going to empty my brain out to you, and then uh, um, uh, this will be great for me, and then I'm just going to go back to my office. And eventually, like some of the other writers, they would come around to me, and they would say, hey, Rob, what are you working on? And we all started working on everybody else's pro- projects. So I did a lot of work on Frozen. I did a lot of work on Tangled, on Wreck-It Ralph, you know, months and months, uh, you know, on all of those, those projects, um, simply because I – I thought the most important thing to do was a good movie. And right. um and that becomes the spirit of the place. So yeah, so Ed talks about that a lot. Like, okay, it was infectious because that's what they do up in, in, in Emeryville. You know, mm-hmm. it's not just, oh, it's just here's your movie, it's got your name on it and screw you. It's no. It 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 all goes under the Disney, you know, the Disney Pixar banner. And right. it all has to be of quality. And if your movie stinks, the people that are you know the people are going to be resistant to come into my movie you know next year right. and yeah. but if my movie is is great then it feeds you know uh Mark's movie next year and you know Don's movie the next year and you know uh Ron and John's they've got another one and boom you know it, it there's I knew that would happen and, and sure enough it did you know the, the Princess and the Frog did did its numbers Tangled did even better numbers and then and then Frozen is like you know the Titanic crazy um, yeah yeah, and like there is not a single dad of a daughter in America who who can't sing. Do you want to build a snowman? Um, you know, that's that's a phenomenon. That's the same thing I saw on Fresh Prince. You know, where people mm-hmm. need to to trust it in the first two episodes. They need to be consistent, and then the third thing, everybody goes nuts, and then you've built a studio. You know, yeah. Uh, but that's and that's that's fun. But there was always there was always over there the big resistance. People just saying like, I don't know, I don't. I, 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 you know, I don't buy into this man's bag of magic. (laughs) (laughs) Get out of here with your crazy ideas. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) The earth is flat. (laughs) It's always been flat. It's always going to be flat. Get out of here with you. Is that something that happens a lot? I mean, do you, do you have like a lot of people who are just kind of like helping collaborate? And then at the end of the day, there's like the people that are, basically credited as writing it i mean is that kind of right common? well yeah exactly and that that is that happens in tv all the time mm-hmm. there's a great writer earl pomerantz and his his acceptance for uh i believe winning an uh, emmy for taxi was you know i'd like to thank uh thank the academy and thank all the actual writers uh, uh who, <laughs> who worked on it because there's not a single word of what i wrote in this movie you know, the episode you've seen and <laughs> and that's basically it you just kind of trust that you know, everybody is going to have their hand in everybody else's pie. And Mm -hmm. ultimately it's better. The room is what is writing the, the the movies and the, and the TV shows, the individual. Yeah. There's, there's a little bit of pride of ownership, but there's not, it's not like if you just sit down and do a webcast or, you know, um, or, or just point a camera at yourself and you you write your own uh, dialogue and everything like, no, 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 you're going to get, you're going to get, uh, a little bit of vox populi, you know, you, you're going to get the consensus of the room, and right. there's a there's a beauty in that. Um, when it's well managed, you get some of that. You get some of the okay, great. The room thinks this, but 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 then you also get, like I say, people going into their caves and writing writing things that are truly from their own heart, and then you go back to the table and you say, please don't change this. This is this this moves me. This to me is the most important scene in the movie. And, uh, and I just want everybody to buy my vision. And, and, and usually a, a room that, that understands great filmmaking will say, yes, 
this is this is great. This is truly wonderful. Let's not let's not change this. Let's not step on this. Everybody has their own interpretation of what you know a, a hug between a father and a son is. Let's not make it our own. Let's just go with this thing. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a there's a the first bunch of sequences with Tiana and her dad in um, uh, in Princess and the Frog were not originally there. We're not there for a long time, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a piece of the gumbo. I love that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and the problem right. was people were like, yeah, we love it. The movie is great, but there's no emotional impact to it. And and I said, yeah, well, the dream of having a restaurant was just a girl with a dream. And can we give it emotional? Can we can we have it be an emo, you know have emotional depth when she says my restaurant those words? And uh, there was this little piece of artwork. Uh, there was a drawing of the dad. The dad was not a character in the movie. And mm-hmm. I went to the artist. I said, well, why is, why is there this drawing? Was, was the dad originally a character in there? Because yeah, these things are around for years. Right. And, I, and, and, uh, 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 and he said, no, no, no. What, what happened was, I was, I was uh, we knew what Tiana would look like, and I wanted to draw the mother. So I wanted to see what the father would look like because the – the, the way it would go is that the, the mother and the father would share um, uh, facial characteristics with Tiana. And I wanted to figure mm-hmm. out, okay, well, here's what the dad looks like and here's what the mom looks like and here's what Tiana <laughs> looks like. And so it was just wow. like a, a mathematical uh, you know, uh, thing for him. He's like, okay, dad, mom, yeah. whatever. This is what the mom looks like. <laughs> and he said, I knew I wanted her to be hot, so I knew that I wanted all of the kind of <laughs> other characteristics to be on the dad, and so this is what the dad looks like. I was like, yeah. oh, okay, cool. Um and I took that, I said, can I borrow this? And uh, I went into the writer's room and I said, well, this is the most important character in the movie, you know, but he's not here. And uh, I said, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? I said, well, I don't know. I, I have this feeling that Tiana and her dad, you know, whatever, that, that it's her, it's a shared dream. It's a bedtime story. They always tell it's the, it's, it's parenting. It's, um, you know, it's, it's I'm going to have this thing. We're going to do this together. Again, going back to my dad talking to me about, yes, we're going to have a medical practice together. It's going to be so awesome, <laughs> you know, guts all day. And, uh, <laughs> and me going like, oh, okay, dad. You know, so, so Tiana is a better, is a better, you know, child than I, <laughs> you know. So uh, the gumbo is cut, right? Yes, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah, cut that gumbo. <laughs> so... So, uh, yeah, so I, so, so I wrote it, and, and uh, I just said, well, this is what I think it is, and I hope it's, I'm going to try not to write it too long, which is why those scenes overlap, you know, where they, where she, uh, they get home, and, uh, you know, I'm going to sample the gumbo, and uh, this is the best gumbo I've ever tasted, dissolved to gumbo is the, you know, his philosophy, and then her, him kissing her goodnight, and, and off they go. That's only about two and a half to three minutes of, of storytelling. In an animation, every minute is a million dollars. So <laughs> so when I showed him the scene, it was a big, huge discussion. You know? <laughs> like, oh my God, what has Rob added to this thing? This is terrible. And, um, and, and, uh, but that was the thing. It's like, I, I just, I felt it. I, and I felt that the movie would be better for it. And the spirit of collaboration, those guys were like, you know what? Yes, absolutely. And now when you see it, you can't imagine it being without those things. Gumbo smells good, Tiana. I think it's going, Daddy. Yeah, are you sure? Mm-hmm. Absolutely positive. Yes. Okay, I'm about to put this spoon in my... Wait! <laughs> Done. Hmm. What? Well, sweetheart... This is the best gumbo I've ever tasted. <laughs> Come here. You do our little girl got a gift. Mm-hmm. I could have told you that. <laughs> a gift this special just got to be shared. Hey, everybody. I made gumbo. Oh, that smells good. I got some hush puppies, Tiana. Here they come. You know, the thing about good food, it brings folks together from all walks of life. It warms them right up and it puts little smiles on their faces. And when I open up my own restaurant, I tell you, people are going to line up for miles around just to get a taste of my food. Our food. (laughs) That's right, baby. Our food. 
you know, because every time she refers to it and she kisses her dad's picture in the beginning, you know, we see the war medal and all that stuff. And the, it, it influences the scene when, when her mom brings the pot and she's saying, oh, you know, your father would have loved this place. You know, all that stuff. Like, yes, now it's working, you know, because cause right. we're, we're, we're not just telling – it's not plot. It's story. It's emotion. It's character. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so it just made it made it a lot better. But it wouldn't have happened had I not just kind of – uh, um, if he wasn't trying to make her hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. If an artist hadn't been trying to make a hot mom and, uh, <laughs> and you know, whatever. But yeah, all of the collaboration. And certainly there were other things, you know, like and, and a bunch of the, there were there were things where people um, uh, people would go the opposite way, where I would say I would be resistant to ideas that later turned out to be brilliant. And, mm-hmm. and just that, for me, the spirit of collaboration being like... Uh, like you know what? Okay, I I won my little battle. I'm gonna I'm gonna see how well I can execute the idea that this that that this person has, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm gonna try to plus it as much as I can. But I'm gonna stay out of the way. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna mess with it. Uh, I'm gonna help it along. And then you watch it. and You go, yep. Yeah, I was a jerk. I, you know, for <laughs> for not for not believing in the idea. Um, at first and, and just, you know, uh, but, but it's always better when you just say, okay, trust the process. This person has a vision. This person is an artist too. And, uh, and it's all going to contribute to this really great, you know, gumbo in in the end. And it's going to be fantastic. Right. Are there any kind of, um, rules that Disney has in terms of like, there, there always seems to be like two wacky characters that they (laughs) meet along the way. I, no. I don't know. I, I think that's just part of storytelling. I think that like if you get once you get on the road, you know you're going to have um, it's planes, trains, and automobiles, right? It, uh, uh, right? There's a there's a movie called The Defiant Ones that I heard was uh, one of John Lasseter's favorite movies, um, um, and it's you know Sidney Poitier and, and Tony Curtis, and uh, it's a darker story. It's about race and whatever, but along the way, there are all the signposts that you see in Toy Story. And uh, and just in the genre, like as I'm as when I'm looking for structural cousins that I uh, you know um, uh, when I'm kind of screening movies, I'll look at five movies that are in my genre, and a lot of times you'll see, oh okay great yeah, you go to play you know you use you travel in, in interesting ways you know two or three really interesting vehicles, uh, you stay in interesting places, uh, and you meet interesting people along the way. A lot of times you collect those people as you go. And that's mm-hmm. what makes the story really cool. And uh and whether it's um you know whether it's one of those things or if I'm doing an adult thing or or you know I was just uh, uh uh talking to somebody about doing kind of a superhero road picture and you know and <laughs> and the same the same tenets apply. You know the, the, those same things make make storytelling really really exciting. Uh, you know, yeah, you want to meet, like, who are the people who live here, you know, and what are those right. people, if those people share your dreams or if they, if, if there's a new momentum, each one kind of brings a uh, breath of fresh air to the storytelling. In the right. case of uh, Princess and the Frog, the question was always, should, should we meet Lewis first or should we meet Ray first? And, mm. uh, and that was a big debate because at, at a certain point we met Ray first and, Ray is so funny. He kind of sucked the energy out of <laughs> out of Lewis, and, mm. um, and Ray's the the crocodile. The right? crocodile, exactly. Yeah, the gator. Don't man, you get in trouble if you say. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Sorry, <laughs> he's an the alligator. Gator. He's not a crocodile. I'm edit this, man. See, yeah, you talk about rules. That was the thing because <laughs> well, and that's, it's very funny because I, I I love this and I tell every writer this. John Lasseter is a, uh, is a is a mega geek. He's the geek of all geeks. He loves <laughs> research. So if you're doing Finding Nemo, there are things about find, you know there is a ton of research that goes into that. They take weeks and weeks, you know, researching fish and what fish are are uh, you know specific to that area. What do you see? You know, what are the bioluminescent fish that you see in there? Sharks are they the same? Are they the, the exact sharks that you would find in those waters? You know, what is that current? You know, all that stuff comes out of the research, and uh, mm-hmm. and you geek out on that. 
And, you know, with, with Princess and the Frog, like, I did a ton of research on frogs. I know exactly what kind of frogs they are. And what, and what, uh, what frogs eat, what eats frogs, what, what the environment is like. You know, when they get to the when they get to New Orleans, you can basically walk the, uh, you know, you can take a camera and walk that entire thing. We didn't make any of that up. That's all actual New Orleans uh, locations and stuff. Uh, the proximities, you know, the, the, the uh, graveyard and the uh, church, everything. It's all, all one, one for one. And, and that stuff is, 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 is really amazing. Yeah, so when you say, like, oh, <laughs> the crocodile, it's like, oh, man, Every, people get kicked out of rooms for that. Uh, you know, it's hilarious. Yeah, but uh, I mean, is there? Uh, well, let me let me move it. I mean, I'm, uh, how are you doing for time? You um, okay? I you need to wrap it up. Yeah, uh, uh, fifteen more minutes. I I, I can do. It. Okay. Yeah, um, can can you talk about just a little bit um, quickly about the bad guys and and kind of their how you write them and what kind of rules there are with that in terms of their re- relationship with the the protagonist? Yeah. Well, with bad guys. It's interesting because I'm I'm um, I I think bad guys run the story in mm-hmm. in a lot of a lot of movies and people don't really realize that so they'll 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 use the bad guy as an afterthought. Um, there are rules for them. The, the bad guy is either going after the same thing as the protagonist, or the bad guy is in opposition to the protagonist in some meaningful way. What they do in, say, a Marvel movie is fantastic, and I love the way that they they do antagonists, which is the antagonists in, uh, say, um, uh, Iron Man 1, um, Ant-Man, some of the others, the antagonist is using the same devices as the good guy, but in an evil way. Right, so even even Captain America, right, the, the Red Skull, is from the same experiment as Captain America, as as as, as uh, Steve Rogers, but he mm-hmm. is uh, the uh, the the experiment has gone wrong, and now he's doing the wrong things with it. And Captain America, by virtue and everything, is is going to defeat him using the same tools. Ant Man, the same thing, right? The guy has uh, has designed his own suit. And he's doing terrible things, and our guy is doing great things, and he's willing to make uh, virtuous sacrifices for it. Iron Man, you know that that um, uh, that that uh, you know you have one guy in the suit that that's even better, even huger than 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 Iron Man suit. But Iron mm-hmm. Man has you know he's fighting for this ideal. He feels guilty that he's he's been purveyor of all this violence around uh, around the world, and he wants to right his wrongs and that strength is going to is going to carry the day in the third act right okay so that's Mm -hmm. one type the other type is that uh here is a uh an antagonist in opposition to to my guy he doesn't want like facilier right facilier wants the prince and tiana wants the prince Facilier wants him for terrible reasons. He wants his blood. He wants to, you know, <laughs> do this whole experience, right. you know, this this thing to to masquerade, and um, uh, but Tiana wants him because he's falling in love with him. So they're both after the same guy, and uh, and so the all in all is lost is when she's lost the guy when she, when he's getting married to Charlotte. Mm-hmm. Um, it gives you a goal, you know, that the the, the guy is trying to win. Darth Vader is trying to kill everybody, you know, and Luke right. wants to save everybody. Darth Vader is using the same powers, again, the Marvel model or, or you know, whatever, the, the Eternal model, the Joseph Campbell model. The, um, Darth Vader is the dark side of the thing that Luke is trying to master. And the story mm-hmm. is about, you know, the, 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 those two, um, uh, that ability misused and used well. So those make, those, that's what makes for great, great stories sometimes it, it, it's internal right the 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 uh it can be a demon uh like in flight it's alcoholism is the antagonist in that thing or cocaine mm-hmm. usage right the addiction right. in general so uh and there's this great scene at the end of act two where he's he's about to go to his um go to the trial and you see that the and they've cleaned the the uh, hotel room of all alcohol and everything, you know, whatever. There are people standing mm-hmm. outside the door, and he sees that the door next next to him is open, and there's a mini bar, and there's all that stuff, right? That's a great, <laughs> <laughs> that's a fantastic antagonistic scene because the door is just kind of make, making this noise. It's the character yeah. in the movie. It's fantastic, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the same as in Toy Story, where they they said no, there will be no bad guys. The bad guy in Toy Story is just hubris, is you know, is selfishness, 
is that mm-hmm. Andy is that uh, Woody doesn't think there's room on the bed for two toys. Yeah, he's Andy's favorite toy. He's the only favorite toy, and he's going to kick Buzz out the window, you know, to to maintain his his status. And ultimately, he has to learn, you know, he has to flip it. He has to defeat that that part of him and say, no, there's room on the bed or you know in the car for two two favorite toys. Um, yeah. Uh, By the way, can I can I just say mention something real quick? I think one sure. of the funniest things I've ever heard was the early Tom Hanks readings of uh, Woody, because they they had him written as a really just a jerk, you know. Yeah. I don't know if you aren't ever, those great. You, you should see it. There, yeah. there, are, there are storyboards. <laughs> you can see the storyboards online if you if you search "angry Woody," you, uh-huh. you know, Google it. It's it's really funny because you see these like terrified toys and this angry Woody <laughs> just kind of yelling at him. And, uh, yeah, and, and it was because they thought, okay, well, you know, you have the first act, you want to have him be mean, and then he's going to turn around in the, in the, in the final act. And it was, this, it was just terrible. And that was when <laughs> the, 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 the interesting thing in the evolution of Pixar with that was that that was the screening that almost got everybody fired. And out <laughs> of that screening, Steve Jobs said, wow. you know, he couldn't do it anymore, and uh, – and uh, you know Disney was gonna you know, Disney was gonna shut them down, and Andy uh, Andrew Stanton and um, and uh, J- John uh, and, and Ed said just give us two weeks you know we're gonna try <laughs> we're gonna try this again in two weeks, and um, uh, and if that fails then send us all home, and uh, I was talking to Bob Peterson about this who directed you know uh, Up and um, you know uh, uh, Monsters Inc. And he said mm-hmm. Andrew Stanton went into a room with all the books, you know, with Robert McKee and John Truby and you know whatever, and <laughs> uh, you know Save the Cat and all that stuff. He went in the room and he, uh, uh, I mean, who knows what? I'm guessing what he took in there, but like he went into the dark room, into the dark cave, his own third act, and um, and he he figured it out. He just figured mm-hmm. out the the um, you know uh, universal theory of of, of storytelling. And when he came out, he said, "This is it. This is what we're going to do. This, 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 this." And he and he kind of ran ran through it, and it was glorious. Obviously, it's a template for for all uh, all Pixar movies. And uh, yeah, and that was the thing. He was just like, you know, back to the wall. Um, that's what that's what came of it. That's why I, that's why I say like embrace embrace the suck. You know, it's gonna suck. You know, learn <laughs> learn from it. You know, write that terrible terrible draft. Just get it done. Because um, yeah. uh, you can't learn from it if you don't do it. Uh, you know, you're just gonna think it's always wonderful in the in the you know uh, ethereal when you're just thinking, oh, if if I write a screenplay, it's gonna be wonderful. I'll just sit down someday and write a perfect screenplay. It's like no, <laughs> right. you have to write 40 horrific screenplays, <laughs> and then uh, uh, and then eventually, you know, the the you know your back is to the wall. Everybody's gonna <laughs> everybody's mad at you, and then you're gonna write this. <laughs> this you're going to figure it out. You're going to see the matrix and this, this wonderful thing is going to come. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I'm going to let you go because you've been, you know, nice enough to give me over two hours of, of amazing <laughs> information here. I, I've oh, really man. enjoyed this. Yeah. Right. How long is your podcast? Oh, uh, it, it that's the nice thing is it's as long as I want. I mean, the, oh, awesome. the longest okay, one good. is, uh, is three hours. Okay. You okay. Know, good. But uh, this is this is definitely one of those. You know, it's but it's that's what what I really love about it is that we can actually have the time to to really get into stuff instead of exactly. just kind of like hitting the surface. Exactly. But, um, I love talking about this stuff, and and it's uh, my mom always told me like, hey, get good at something and then turn around and tell people what you did. You know. <laughs> and so yeah, I love talking about this stuff, and and you know, I'm always always telling people I'm not a teacher. I'm a writer who turns around and teaches. Um, right. And so, so like I say, I've I've got two two doors full of post-it notes right now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> with, with, I'm breaking two stories. I have one out right now. I have uh, I'm starting. You're gonna uh, have to start building some rooms onto your house. To, I tell like, you, have new doors. You know? Yeah, just a just a maybe I'll just start <laughs> buying doors <laughs> like, you know, and just line them up like a museum. New door, Rob. Yeah, I'm writing a story. Yeah. Well, I figure every door has two sides, so I get two stories <laughs> off of each door. And, uh, right. yeah, I can just kind of walk around the house. My my wife hates it. But it's, you know, <laughs> but it's like, okay, just don't open the door too fast. I'm not, I'm not I gotta, I gotta write down what's on it. 
Yeah. <laughs> Don't turn on the fan. Oh no. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's all bad. But yeah, yeah. So it's 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 a ton of fun, and hopefully people you know will get get uh, fun stuff out of it. I should tell you too, because um, people would be mad at me if I don't. That I have a website. It's uh, robedwards.net, um, okay. and a uh, and you can also find me on Facebook at Rob Edwards Workshop, um, uh, where just every so often I'll I'll see an article and I'll throw it up there, or I'll be thinking about like our conversation. I'll leave it and I'll go, hey. Here's something else about antagonists, you know, right. and I'll just throw it up uh, on the on either the website or the or the Facebook page, and you know, okay. uh, and also it's a great chance for writers to meet other writers and you know, kind of connect and share share screenplays, you know, uh, yell at each other, Pixar style, and have fun. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Well, I I really appreciate it, and uh, you know, thanks so much for talking to us. I'm sure oh, well, all the writers you. there have learned a lot. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. It's been been very fun. All right. That's going to do it for today. I want to thank my guest, Rob Edwards, for coming on. Um, We have a lot of great stuff coming up, so definitely subscribe to the podcast. And if you like what you're hearing, go to iTunes and give us a review. It 